I have a really weird story that happened to me about six months ago. And it's actually one of those things that really messed with my head after it happened. Like I said, this was around my birthday, which is in the first week of August. I just turned 18 last year, so I still live with my parents as I've been finishing school and planning on my college. And my brother also lives with us. He's 22, and during the pandemic, he lost his job, and his lease on his apartment also came up for renewal, so he decided that moving back home when he had the opportunity to do so was a good idea. In the week of my birthday, we were planning a family dinner to celebrate, and we were going to have my grandma and my aunts come over. Basically, it was supposed to be a fun little get-together among close family, making the most of what we had and the day in general. My mom was making dinner, my grandma and my aunts were all in the living room talking, and my dad and siblings were out in the backyard. My mom then lets out a fairly large, damn it, and naturally, thinking something was wrong, I walked in and asked if she was okay. She tells me to go get my brother, so I do. She then mentions to him that she had forgotten to get the candles for my cake. I tell her it's not really a big deal, that we don't need to do all that, and she insists, saying it's my last birthday as her little girl, and that this would be the last time she could ever do this for me. I wasn't going to fight it after that. She had her mind set on what she wanted to do, and that was it. My brother gets his keys, and he asks me if I want to go with him to the store. At first, I said yes, but then my mom chimed in and said, No, I want you to go spend time with your grandma. He'll be fine. I say sorry, and he makes a comment about how he's going to find yellow candles since I don't have to go. I hate the color yellow with the passion, so... This was him taunting me. I head to the living room, he goes out to his car, and we move on from there. I was sitting in the living room talking to my grandma when I got hit with this really weird sense of dread. It was like a panic attack was coming on, but it was not a panic attack. It was this really weird feeling of the entire world coming down on me. That's the only way I know how to explain it. I was feeling normal, and within the next few minutes, I was feeling like the literal sky was crashing down around me, and that the earth was going to split in two and swallow me up without a second thought. I excused myself as best as I could and ran to the bathroom. As soon as I shut the door, I got this horrible feeling like I was literally punched in the stomach. If you've ever been punched, you know the feeling. Your lungs empty, you hunch over instinctively, your eyes start to water, and you can feel the blood pressure building up in your eyes. Don't ask how I know this. At this point, I'm sitting on the floor of the bathroom feeling like I had just gotten my ass kicked, and still feeling this god-awful sense of dread and I have no idea how long I was just sitting there and waiting for it to pass. I would say it was probably 10-15 to 15 minutes or so before I opened the door to head back out. And, as soon as I did, I saw my mother, grandmother, and my aunts all in the back living room, all kind of huddled up and crying. I head in, and as soon as I get in there, my mom turns to hug me tightly, and then tells me that my brother was in an accident, and that he was being rushed to a nearby hospital. She said that he wasn't in critical condition, but that he was really badly banged up, and that they were going to head up there to see him right away. Long story short on this, he was hit nearly head-on by another car. Someone that wasn't paying attention to the road and had pretty much taken a left turn straight into his car. He had a couple broken bones, but nothing terribly severe, and if anyone cares, he has made a full recovery. The part that gets me, that 
actually bothers me is that this person hit the passenger side of the car more than the driver's side. And based on what I saw of the car, if I had been in that seat, I would have most likely been severely injured or worse. And, based on the timeline of events, he most likely got hit around the same time I started feeling that horrible dread and the pain in my stomach. I know that this sounds really dumb to some people, but in my mind, I was supposed to be in that car. I'm not a huge believer in fate, or destiny, but I feel like that was supposed to be my end. Somehow, my mom managed to intervene with what was supposed to happen, and told me that I had to stay. But because she changed what was supposed to happen, I ended up still feeling some of what had happened. Almost like I was still in the seat at that time, but it was out of place. I know that sounds really weird and maybe hard to understand, but I really do feel like I did some sort of weird quantum timeline shift and managed to get out of a fatal situation. However, the Matrix was a bit slow to update, and I still got to feel what I would have felt in the crash. A little backstory. A few years ago, my neighbor moved out, abandoning more than half a dozen cats. We fed and took care of the ones that we could, and eventually found homes for most. There was one that my kids just fell in love with. She was friendly and never had any aggression towards our other two indoor cats when they would sit at the patio door, so we ended up adopting her. She was a seamless fit into our family, but there was and still is something about her that just seems different. By the way, her name is Honey. On to the story with a little context to help paint the picture. Since the day we brought her into the house, which was about two years before this specific incident, every morning when my two teenage kids would go out to wait for the bus, Honey would go with them. We would have the same routine, Monday through Friday, and wake up, get ready. When the kids would be getting their shoes on, she would sit patiently by the door to go out to wait for the bus with them. As long as it wasn't raining, she would always sit with them at the end of the driveway. If it was raining, she would sit under my car, directly in my line of sight, and watch from there until the bus came. As soon as they were picked up, she would run back up the driveway and come back inside where her and my other two cats would sit on their mats and wait for their morning treats. I always stood at the door watching them get on the bus. I know I said they're teenagers, but I stand there so I can let Honey back in after they were picked up. So, our day started out the same. It was raining, so Honey was sitting under my car. I was standing at the screen door for about ten minutes. The bus pulls up, and the kids get on. I get ready to open the door for Honey, but for the first time, she didn't come right to the door. I opened it, hoping to prompt her to come in, and she didn't move. It was so abnormal for her not to come right in that I thought that maybe there was something wrong. I scooched down a little to make sure her fur wasn't caught on the undercarriage of my car, and it wasn't. I waited, I would say, about a minute or two longer, and gave her one last look to see if she had decided to come in, but she was still loafed out under my car, and since I needed to get on with my day, I figured I would check in a few minutes later to see if she changed her mind. As I went to shut the main door, I pushed on it lightly and it wouldn't close. I nudged a little harder, and there was a little give, but... Still, it wouldn't shut all the way. So I opened the door, and that's when I saw the reason for why my door wouldn't shut. Sandwiched in between the screen door and the main door was honey. But 
This was impossible for two reasons. For one, I had just seen her still sitting under my car. For two, our screen door isn't all screen. I guess it may be considered more of a storm door, where the bottom part is metal and the top part has the option to slide a glass panel down to have the screen open on the top half. So, it's not like she ran through some hole in the screen and then got stuck. I pushed on the metal panel from both sides. If she'd somehow gotten through it with brute force, it would have been loud. And the metal part was solid. There was no way through it. And again, there was no way for her to get from under my car to in between the two doors in the one or two seconds between me looking at her one last time to me closing the main door. So, was this a glitch? After I stood there for probably way too long looking between my car and the door, trying to wrap my head around what just happened, I remembered that we had recently upgraded our home security cameras and I could access all of it on my phone. I pulled up the part that I wanted and watched. First, my daughter walks out. Then, Honey and her behind my son. You can see Honey go under my car and then... nothing. She never comes back out. You can't see her on video under the car, and there's one blind spot for that specific camera that she could have walked through the bushes and it wouldn't have been picked up but that would mean that she would have had to have run through the bushes, around the house, to the back door, somehow gotten through a locked slash closed door or window, and then gotten between the two doors in less than a second or two without me seeing her. Honestly, a glitch in the Matrix makes more sense than that scenario. I watched the video until way past the time of the incident just to be sure, that there was no other doppelganger cats hanging around. I spent two hours going over the other cameras, and specifically the one that would catch the angle of the bush, and no cat walked from under my car into the bush, and there were no other cats in my yard that morning. I will note, this is not the first incident like this. It was just the first one that I couldn't explain away by just remembering wrong, or thinking that I was just imagining it. I honestly could not explain what happened that morning, and before I came across Glitch in the Matrix YouTube videos, I really didn't have any form of reference to help me wrap my head around all of it. I'd never really heard any stories like the ones I've been listening to, I had heard the term, but never gave it much thought. But after hearing all of these different accounts of odd, unexplainable situations, it gave me the answer that I needed. Even though that answer has changed me at the very core as far as my beliefs, as far as what I thought reality was, and so much more, but I, I think you get it. I'm sorry for how long this is, but... For anyone who's ever had something like this happen, I'm sure you can attest to the fact that all you want to do is explain anything and everything in a way that people will feel even just a tiny bit of the extraordinary, scary, unbelievable feelings you felt while going through an event like this. While I experienced a time glitch at work last year in May of 2021, it was not my first time-related glitch in the Matrix. My first glitch related to time took place at the library at the University of California, Santa Barbara, during my first year of college. Note, this is a rather detailed composition of my experience. Originally, I had written about it near the time of the event in an email, before forwarding it across several email accounts, and then finally transferring my story to my long-defunct online journal. Rest in peace, Zanga in the blog section of MySpace. I finally decided to share this publicly, with a few present-day details. 
I attended UCSB from 2000 to 2004. I barely went out in order to not spend any money, if possible, and probably used all the credits on my meal plan for the school year. Quick shout out to Ortega Dining Commons for the takeout meals that sustained me during some all-night cramming sessions. As a bookish student, I spent a lot of time at Davidson Library in my freshman year, choosing the floor I would study at with no rhyme or reason. By the end of the school year, I could honestly say that I have studied on each floor of the library at least once, including inside the spectacular Pacific View Room on the 8th floor. Halfway into the first quarter of the school year, in the middle of October of 2000, I began preparing for my midterms. I was not the type of person who could study at home, treating my dorm room at Santa Rosa Residence Hall as my bedroom and nothing else. The glitch took place after I had taken half of my midterms. I had taken two of my midterms in as many days so far, and met up with my roommates at Ortega for lunch at around noon. Afterward, we parted ways as he headed for the university center, Yusen, to start his shift at the bookstore, thanks to a work-study program, while I headed over to Davidson Library. I entered the library through the Davidson entrance since, at the time, it was the main entrance to the library. This shows my age, as major renovations saw the construction of a new library entrance and a wing a decade after I graduated and left the school. I headed for the Ocean's Elevator, a set of three elevators with access to all eight floors of the library tower, and I pressed the up button. The middle elevator opened immediately. I stepped inside, turned around, and pressed the button for the eighth floor. After a short wait, the elevator doors closed, and I went up to the eighth floor alone without stopping on any of the floors in between. When the elevator doors opened on the eighth floor, I stepped outside the elevator and took two steps and abruptly stopped in my tracks. I was surrounded by the exposed concrete floor slab, save for the elevated tile flooring I was standing on directly in front of the elevator. There was construction equipment and bags of masonry material everywhere, but there were no walls or windows to speak of. Undoubtedly, the place that I ended up was under construction and open to the elements. I went back inside the elevator to see which floor I was on, and the LED panel showed a number 8 with a down arrow. Tentatively, I went back outside and walked straight from the elevator due west toward the edge of the apparent construction area. In the distance, I saw the setting sun slowly dipping below the horizon of the Pacific Ocean. If you go to the beach to watch the sunset at UCSB over the course of the year, you'll see that, thanks to the tilt of the Earth. The sunsets over the Pacific Ocean during the colder winter months, and over the California mainland during the warmer spring and summer months. Seeing the sunset caught me off guard almost right away since it was not supposed to occur for several hours. After all, my roommate and I had left the dining commons together at about 5 minutes before 1pm so that he wouldn't be late for work. I was further shocked by something else I saw, or rather didn't see. I looked down at the Yusen by the campus lagoon, and Stork Tower was not there. I mean, there's no way anyone on campus could overlook a bell and clock tower that stands at 175 feet, let alone from the vantage point of the 8th floor of the library. I turned to my right, looking due north, and saw the peaks of the Santa Ynez Mountains, covered in snow. As far as I knew, no precipitation of any kind had fallen yet in the Santa Barbara area since the beginning of the school year, never mind any rain in the local beach areas and especially not any snow in the local mountains. 
While I stared at the snow-covered mountains, a small plane emerged from just below my field of vision and gained altitude, apparently taking off from the local airport. After the plane disappeared from sight, I looked down and saw the rooftop of the original two-story library adjacent to the library tower. I did an about-face and looked due south toward the Pacific Ocean. In the distance, I saw Santa Cruz Island of the Channel Islands Archipelago, just off the coast. When I looked down, I was stunned to find that the four-story wing built just south of the library tower was missing. In its place were far more bicycle racks than I remember seeing previously, as these bike racks extended from the bike path to the edge of the library tower. By the way, I had only been on the 8th floor for about two minutes so far, so I was somewhat surprised when I saw that the doors of the elevator I took were still open as I turned around. While taking all of this in, I snapped back to my purpose of being there at the library in the first place, and promptly headed due east for behind the elevators, where the Pacific View Room should have been. Unfortunately, this area was also under construction. I looked over this edge of the concrete floor slab, and I saw Webb Hall below. Given the distance between the library and Webb Hall, another building could very well fit in the open space. I looked up and in the distance, I saw the Mesa, an expansive neighborhood in the city of Santa Barbara. UCSB is technically in the city of Galetta, but that's a story for another time. The neighborhood diverted my attention for something I was not expecting to see. Streetlights. The apparent sunset meant that the streetlights were slowly turning on throughout the city as it became evening. I was not going to get caught in the darkness of an apparently unfinished library floor that did not have electricity or lights, nor did I want to stick around in a place and time that was very different from the one that I came from. I headed for the elevator that I took, since the doors were still open, and pressed the 1 button. The doors promptly closed, and I headed back downstairs. As I made my way down, I had come to the disconcerting conclusion that, some way, somehow, I went back in time. It wasn't just an abrupt change in time of day, either. I briefly ended up in the past, when the library tower was still under construction, while Stork Tower and the four-story wing of the library did not yet exist. When I reached the first floor, I stepped outside the elevator and looked to my right. I saw the long passageway connecting the library tower to the original library. Adjacent to the elevators were several payphones, as well as a dorm phone. My roommate and I opted to not get a landline for our dorm, since we had cell phones anyway. I turned to my left and walked towards the entrance that I had just walked through mere minutes ago. To my enormous relief, I saw the current serials section, which houses printed magazines, journals, and newspapers, and is located on the lower level of the first floor of the four-story wing. Next to the entrance of this section is a staircase leading to the ethnic and gender studies section on the second floor of the same wing. There were lots of people on the staircase going in both directions as I headed for the exit. I looked through the glass doors and realized that not only was I back in the present time, but also the same time of day as when I arrived there, just five minutes ago. As I stepped outside the library, soaring between Gervitz Hall and the music library was Stork Tower. I walked toward the tower and paused upon arriving at the entrance of the music library. I continued looking up at the stork tower, still pondering what I had seen while up in the library tower. I went inside the Yusen, found a table outside of a cafe, and studied for my third midterm until 5pm when my roommate got off work at the bookstore. He was surprised to see me, of course. Over dinner back at the Ortega, 
I told him everything that I had experienced just after lunch that day. He was skeptical, but he ultimately believed me, especially because he felt that my earnest recollection of that day's events over the years, we still keep in touch to this day, was the only time that he had ever sensed fear in me. This was the one and only such event that I ever experienced during my time at UCSB. I've been to the 8th floor of the library tower countless times since, until I graduated, but I never went back in time again. I've taken my roommate and our friends there, I've taken my family there when my sister was exploring colleges, she ended up going to UCSC, she'd rather be a banana slug than a caucho, I guess. I've taken classmates and even a girlfriend there. Sadly, I was not able to replicate my experience of going back in time with any of them. During the elevator rides to the 8th floor, I would secretly hope that the doors would open to a construction site with random but prominent features from the university's skyline missing in all directions only to be disappointed upon seeing the scale model of the university as soon as the elevator doors opened on the 8th floor, and, ultimately, a long-ago fully-built library floor with a spectacular view of the Pacific Ocean, each and every time. This is a cross post from r slash parallel universe, but I wanted people's thoughts on it as the whole thing is still a mystery to me, and it still sometimes gives me nightmares, though the nightmares become less frequent with time. Also, I'm going to add in a couple small details that weren't in the story of the original post, because a couple of people asked on the original and I can see why it would be relevant information to have immediately available in the post itself. Back in the summer of 2011, I was 19 and had relocated my living situation for a few weeks while I was in between apartments. It's a long story on its own. Due to my relocation, I was pretty far from my work, and I'd have to drive about an hour south on the Highway 45. At the time, I worked in Spring, Texas, and I could get away with a lot of stuff because we were too short-staffed, and I was one of the more experienced on our night crew. On my first shift having to drive to work from this new area, I ended up getting a bit turned around and lost. I was driving on what I thought had been the highway, but after a bend, it suddenly transitioned into a single-lane road, and then further down the transition to just a dirt road. Ever since it stopped being a highway, there were no areas to turn off. I left my place at around 7pm to arrive at work by 8pm for my shift. This happened around the midway point of the distance, so... Even though I didn't check the time when it happened, it would be a fair estimate to say the sudden change in environment happened at approximately 7.30pm. Thinking this was really strange, as I'd been up and down 45 a million times, and I never saw anything like this. I figured I would just drive until I reached a rest stop, or something, to check my location on GPS and turn around at. It got to be a little uneasy when I went a full 20 minutes without a single spot to stop at or turn into, and without seeing a single other car. I saw a bridge coming up and thought, okay, surely there'll be somewhere to turn around up wherever this bridge leads. Then, I saw it. You are now entering Atascotia. At this point... I was already going to be super late for work no matter what, and I figured I would just send my boss a text and all would be fine. No signal. Thinking, what the hell, I'm going to get in trouble anyways, may as well check out this place for a few minutes and see where I ended up. It was very unsettling. 
The town looked like it had to have been abandoned for decades, buildings all around looking to be falling apart and in terrible disrepair. Not a single building had a light on, and there were no cars or people anywhere in sight. The roads were a mix of some dirt roads and some normal roads in varying states of disrepair. Hell, I didn't even see animals anywhere as I drove through. I could tell as I drove that this town was essentially an island. Every direction seemed to have a beach and a bridge that connected it to land. At least from what I was able to see as I drove around a higher elevated area. After about a half an hour of driving, unable to find any signs of life, I managed to find my way back to the bridge that I came in on, and I got the hell out of there. When I got to work about two hours late, my boss called me back into his office to have a chat. I'd been working there since I was 16, and have never been so much as a single minute late, so he was willing to hear me out. I told him the honest truth of what happened, and he seemed increasingly concerned as my story went on. He and another coworker looked on a map out of curiosity, since they'd never known of any abandoned towns in the area, and they found some place called Atascocita, and they just assumed I'd misread the sign. But when they opened the Google Street View, Atascocita was nothing like the town that I'd seen. The only thing they had in common it was a sort of similar name, and one bridge that connected it from across a lake. But the town I was in was surrounded by water and had bridges connecting it on each end. I'm only in contact with one coworker who was at work that day, and he's convinced I somehow got a bustling old-style town like Atascocita, somehow confused with the long-abandoned ghost town, even though they had nothing in common just because we couldn't find any Atascocia on the map. Two years after, when I went back to live in Spring for a little while, I did try finding Atascocia again, this time with the intent of filming while there to prove that it existed. But alas, no matter how much I retraced my steps, I was never able to find that strange empty path to the bridge again. As a little end note, I'm typically not super comfortable sharing this story with many people, because for obvious reasons, lots of people would probably think I'm crazy, because I'm adamant that I was in a town that no one can seemingly find any evidence of ever having existed. From the few people who I have told over the years, I've gotten answers like slipping somewhere in time that I entered some kind of spirit world or something that I slipped into an alternate reality, and the most common was that I fell asleep on the highway. Though, while that last one certainly sounds the most grounded on the surface, for those who have driven on 45, I'd have 100% died if I had fallen asleep at the wheel in the late evening slash early night on that highway. Accidents are common there even among totally alert drivers. I'm not really sure what to make of it all. As unsettling as the event itself was, the retracing my steps later and not being able to find any trace of it was even more so. Honestly, if I ever ended up back there somehow, someday, I would film the whole thing. Edit. Several comments are asking questions about important details that would be simpler to have in the post. As for whether I ever went to Atascocita to confirm it wasn't where I ended up, I have gone there for that purpose. Atascocita is in a completely different direction from where I'd been driving when all the weirdness happened, but I still wanted to check it out for my own confirmation. And... I can definitively 100% state that I wasn't in Atascocita. The only commonality between the two towns is the kind of similar name and nothing else. As for if there were any street signs or traffic lights or recognizable brands like a Walmart being present or something, 
There were street signs, though sadly I no longer recall any of the road names. There were street lights that weren't working scattered throughout. I did see buildings that looked like they were gas stations and grocery stores, but none of them had a name on the building. I generally assume this is just from the passage of time. To clarify on a point in the post, the town was in major disrepair. Many buildings had parts of them that were just straight up falling apart or collapsed, and some buildings looked to have mild damage on some walls or the rooftops. As for the style of architecture to help everyone have a clearer picture, it was really tough to tell due to the state of the buildings, but the closest approximation I could use is Greek Revival architecture. The designs seemed mostly basic and simple, though there were a handful of buildings that had asymmetrical designs. It's hard to say if this was a result of the building falling apart, or if it was intentional design. Edit 2. Two commenters managed to find a single newspaper reference to the town from the 40s. I'm going to be diving into that along with a bunch of old maps to see if I can find out anything. I'll update with more info soon, I hope. And edit 3. Very important. I haven't yet looked at the old maps, but I did look at Texas's official census data from the same year the newspaper article that mentioned it was from, and I found no census data on it, oddly enough. That said, the publication Oil City Derrick in Oil City, Pennsylvania has an article on page 13 of their October 8, 1942 paper that does mention Atascocia, Texas. This is huge for me, because this is the first time I've seen any evidence that the town ever existed at all, and a huge thank you to the commenters who made this discovery. The mention of Atascocia is brief, and I have no idea why there's no census data on it, but it's the only piece of evidence this town was ever a thing. So I'm diving in. According to this article, some kind of major discovery slash breakthrough occurred in Atascocia regarding oil depth research. And it sounds like they found deposits of oil there that were previously thought to be impossible. And that's all. That's the only mention from the article. And I still need to check maps to try to find it. And I'm a little put off by it not being part of census data for some reason. But there it is. The town that doesn't exist, existed. I'm still very confused regarding how I actually got there, though. There's certainly no such part of 45 that's like what I experienced. Nor do I understand how retracing the same path from that day it didn't lead me back to Atascocia. I still believe on some level that something supernatural that I can't possibly understand happened, but at least knowing that the town existed once is a little comforting. I'll try not to be long-winded, but I need to provide a little backstory, so please be patient. I was an opiate slash heroin addict for about six to seven years between 2008 and 2014. In October of 2014, I had finally had enough and decided to check myself in to the inpatient psychiatric unit at my local hospital so that I could detox myself quickly over about three to five days instead of having to go into another long-term addiction treatment center which was usually about 30 to 60 days. By the time I got to this point in my journey of addiction, I was an IV heroin user and I was using a lot every day just to stay well or feel okay to go about my day. I know it's hard not to judge me and stop reading at this point, but I got run over by a car that my boyfriend was driving 
when I was 18 and just about to graduate high school. I ended up with a compound spiral fracture, meaning the bone broke through the skin, sorry for the visual, of my left leg's tibia bone because of the way the car wheel ran me over. Doctors put a titanium rod through the bone marrow, and they used four screws to keep it in place. Two by my knee, and two at my ankle. I was given a morphine drip plus 80 milligrams of Oxycontin and Vicodin to take home. No cast. Just crutches and a few stitches after the drain was removed. And doctors told me nothing about the possibility of abuse or the risk of addiction with those medications. I was basically still a child, so of course I got hooked. Fast forward from 2007 now. It was 2014, and fentanyl was just starting to break through nationwide, and reports of overdoses skyrocketed around that time because it was getting mixed in with heroin. I live in Maryland, so I was getting my heroin from the deepest and shadiest parts of Baltimore City and dealing with some fairly high-level gangs. My dealer would often offer testers to me, because I was a really good customer. The heroin that I bought from him always came in what was called caps, which were just emptied out and refilled reused vitamin capsules so the dealers could mix their product with other stuff and make more money. When my dealer offered me testers, I always took them, because it meant they were trying out a new, better product and, well, they were free. Free for an addict is like gold. On the day that I decided to go into detox, I went down to the city to pick up my last hoorah, so I could get high one last time right before going in to detox. My dealer had testers that day. A lot of them. I was used to doing about 10 to 30 caps throughout any given day, depending on what I could afford. On this day, he gave me 10 caps. So... I went straight into the emergency room, prepared to use their restroom to get high one last time, and then check myself in. I did all ten caps at once, though. I don't remember what happened after that. I don't remember even checking myself in, but when I woke up in what I now believe to be a parallel universe or alternate reality, meaning I'm pretty sure I overdosed and died in that bathroom that day, in my reality, because those testers were laced with fentanyl, which I had never done before. I was sitting in a detox chair, with IV fluids when the blackness faded. The person next to me was already talking to me when I opened my eyes and quote-unquote woke up. Like he was literally mid-sentence. When I looked over at him, and said, um, what? He repeated himself, and I asked again, no, what are you talking about? Long story short, I felt like I had just been asleep because things went completely black for me after I used those ten caps. But I eventually learned from my detox neighbor that he and I had been talking for at least an hour off and on, and that I never fell asleep once. He said he would have noticed because we talked to each other to keep our minds off the upcoming withdrawals. I had no memory of any conversations that we'd had. And I think he thought that I was just super high and didn't remember, but that is not, I repeat, not the case. Prior to that moment, I had an amazing memory. I was never even high enough in all my years of using to forget entire chunks of time, so I don't believe that's what happened. Anyway, moving on now to why I believe I shifted. And mind you, I'm finally sharing this because it's been ruminating in my mind since October of 2014. I walked into that emergency room completely addicted. Mentally and physically, to not only IV heroin, but the entire process of using. And I also smoked about a pack of cigarettes per day, 
probably more. I was also clearly addicted to nicotine. When I woke up, I went through very short physical heroin withdrawals. Mentally, I didn't even understand why I ever wanted heroin in the first place. I also completely stopped smoking cigarettes from that moment on. I completely stopped wanting them and still to this day find them absolutely disgusting. I don't know if that means the me from this reality was less of an addict of heroin or even nicotine, or if I'm just crazy, but I feel like it's the former. I got straight A's in high school, and graduated with honors even after my accident, so I assure you I am an intelligent, sane human being who is now a full-grown, 32-year-old adult. So immediately things felt off, and they felt off ever since. I, the me from the other reality, remember things that none of my family members remember. In fact, it became a running joke that I have a bad memory, but I have an amazing memory. I'm just remembering things that didn't happen in this reality. Another small example I can think of is that the boyfriend that I mentioned who ran me over? In my reality, my parents were furious with him and demanded that we break up even though it was an accident on his part. In this reality, my parents don't blame him and talks of us breaking up was never mentioned. Then, he overdosed and died. But here's the thing, yes, it's entirely possible that he just did too much, or whatever he used was also laced with fentanyl, even though it wasn't found in my toxicology report. But the boyfriend from my reality never would have done too much. He was terrified of using too much, so much so that he was one of the only few addicts I've ever known who had never once overdosed. Most addicts will overdose and then someone calls 911 and saves them. Many still die too, I know, but this just never sat right with me. Then his friends, who were my closest friends too and I, had a weird falling out, arguing over memories that I had, and they once again did not. We still don't talk about it to this day, and they were my boys in high school. My boyfriend and I had been dating for 11 years by the time he died, so his friends were like brothers to me, in my reality at least. And in my reality, those guys would have never left my side if my boyfriend died. They would have constantly checked in, and made sure it was safe, etc. But... In this reality, it seemed like we were never even that close. Again, maybe I misread things all of those years, but I doubt it. And there's at least a dozen more standout occurrences over the years, but this is long enough, and I do applaud you if you're still reading. Anyways, I wanted to get this off my chest and share it. Who knows, maybe someone will have some insight into this. Or maybe I'll get called crazy. But yeah, that's the gist of it. Things in this world feel very unsettled for me since then. And I can't shake the feeling that I'm somehow in the wrong body. And I hate it. I have what I thought was micro dreams. Dreams that happen in seconds as I nod off to sleep. But where I think this, for me, is a glitch, is when I'm having them, they're just fragments of some random person's life. And they take place in places I've never been, involve people that I've never met. When I'm there, I'm one of them. And that world is real. I know what that person does, and I have no knowledge of me in this world. For example, the glitch nod happens, and boom. I'm on a landline phone telling someone, I've been on the force for longer than any of those kids. And I feel like a 60-something worn-out cop frustrated by the fact that he now takes orders from someone a quarter of his age. Then, boom. 
I'm jolting away at my computer less than a minute past in what felt like 20. I have too many to list, but the one that changed my view on these happened several years ago. I was at the computer, I nodded off, and I was suddenly in a suit with a suitcase standing in an upscale urban area. I was still me this time, as in I was aware of who I was in this world, or this life that I currently exist within. I had actual control of this body. I felt the breeze in the air, experienced all the smells, the sensations of the shoes that I had on being new and not broken in yet. I felt the weight of the suitcase. I smelled coffee in the air and then turned and saw a coffee shop with the place where people could lock up their bicycles. It was dark, but the sky was mostly clear, just some passing clouds. The streets in this area weren't asphalt. They looked like brick pavers, and it wasn't a normal busy street. In fact, the area that I was in wasn't busy at all. I didn't see anyone else but I could hear the traffic not far away. It was just after 10.30, almost 10.40. I, slash he, was wearing a non-digital watch. The ground was slightly wet, like it had rained earlier that day. I was standing near a bus stop. I was taking in everything as I looked around, trying to record this all to memory. Then I started to feel like I was becoming this person. I somehow knew I worked at the building that I was standing by. To my right, there was a tall skyscraper. It was modern looking, but had very distinct architecture. I was so amazed by how clear everything was, and how vivid the colors were. Like watching an HD movie after years of only watching VHS ones. I looked up at the moon just emerging from thinning clouds. It was the moon right before a full moon that almost looks full. I was so amazed by how clearly I could see it. I realized that this body I was in had really good eyesight. Mine in this world needs glasses to see anything more than three foot away. Well, I jolted back to sitting at my PC. I said, I've got this fresh in my head, and I went on to Google Earth looking for this place to see if it was real or not, but then how do I find it? I knew it was within the US, because all the signs were in English and were clearly familiar to me being an American. It was just after 1040 as well, so it was likely in the same time zone. I searched for two hours, and... I found the exact place. I dropped into street view, and a chill went through me like a million volts. Everything was there. The bus stop, the coffee shop, the bike racks, the building. I didn't know what to think. It was late, so I saved the spot on my Google Earth and went to bed. I wish I could share the exact location, but... That computer crashed over a year ago, and I have since changed my Facebook that I originally posted the information to as a record. I just spent an hour looking for it again at work. I'm in shipping and receiving, so it's not out of the norm to be on Google Earth so I know how to find locations with little information. I can't remember the city. Ohio State or Michigan. I think the Matrix deleted it. It's possible the coffee shop went out of business and is now something different, but I found it last time by searching the building description. I'll keep looking for it in my free time, and I'll add it here if I do find it. Just a note, it's been over a month since I wrote this the first time. Still no luck in finding it. Being an artist, I'll attempt to draw the location as I remember the topography. And I'll add a link to this post if I get around to it. Uh, to answer or clarify, I don't know if this was an alternate reality, a glitch, or a road not taken. I don't know. But 
Being somewhat rational, I can't say what it was or wasn't until I find this location again. Until that point, it's just another question mark that makes me the strange guy that I am. The brain is an amazing thing. I think people overlook this fact when in relation to glitches and quantum immortality experiences. Are we shifting realities? Or are we all dreaming or creating realities within our mind? These micro-dream glitches I get scream at me that something else is going on. Because when I'm in these experiences, I usually have no knowledge of this world. Or in case of experiences like this one, when I was aware of this world, it felt like the dream in that one was real. I was asked why I care so much about the nature of reality if I can't change anything. I said, because if this is a simulation or dream of a higher dimensional version of myself, I want it to know that I know. And I want better for humanity than for it to just be an entertainment or an experiment. We are people that love, create, suffering when we don't have to, and we deserve better. So, this happened in July of 2021, and it's really bothered me, but I haven't told anyone until this post. I work for DoorDash and was working later than usual, and it was getting dark. Pretty much fully dark, so I would guess around 8pm. I had finished a delivery and was about to pull onto a six-lane main street, with center turning lane, out of a neighborhood-slash-residential road. The road I'm trying to turn right onto is pretty dead. I look left and see a few cars with headlights on almost a block away at a stoplight. I pull out, and as I do so, I check one more time at the distance of the cars. I don't remember seeing the cars at the light, but now there is a black sedan bearing down on me. And I mean right there, about to hit me. I could still recall exactly what it looked like. The shape of the headlights, my lights were on, and everything. I freeze up and prepare for impact while trying to accelerate out of its way, even though I know it's too late. Nothing happens. I look in all mirrors, turn and look behind me, and only see the other cars I had seen before now approaching but still at a distance. I end for the night, and I head home completely shaken. There's no way I could have dodged that car, and it turned the corner onto the road I was on without hitting me. This is the only way I can explain it vanishing, but it makes no sense. At the speed I was going, at least 40 miles per hour, the speed limit on that road, it would have had to have slammed its brakes, but I also heard nothing. I had this eerie feeling as I drove home that I was dead. I could not shake it for weeks. Now, at this point, I'm sure that I'm not a ghost, but I still cannot let go of the feeling that something is off. Maybe I glitched into a reality where I died or was badly injured. T-boned on the driver's side at 40 miles per hour would not be good, I imagine. And then glitched either back, or maybe I ended up in a different reality from the one that I started in. I feel crazy just saying that, but I just know even now that something is not the same since then. Some things in my life are different since then, too. I don't want to make this too long, but here's a short description of a few of the things that stand out to me. My significant other's stepmother hates me. She was really friendly before, but just kind of snobby. She's a rich person, but since then, she's always hostile when we visit, making rude or snide remarks and or giving me the cold shoulder the whole time. My best friend is really distant. 
she suddenly stopped reaching out to me, and when I reach out to her, she only replies with a few words and then stops. We used to chat for hours almost every day before that. I tried getting to the bottom of it, and she keeps referring to falling out and drifting apart, like it's something that happened over a long period of time. I don't want to weird her out with too many questions, but I just don't recall that. To me, it seemed like she suddenly went longer than usual without talking to me. I'm slowly rebuilding our relationship, but I'm still not sure what from. I'm less anxious about sex. I experienced abuse as a child and adolescent that left me afraid of sex. Suddenly, I'm just able to do it and enjoy it far easier with my significant other than before. We rarely did, barely once a month before this, and now I can do it much more regularly without the difficult mental struggle that came before. I can still recall the trauma, but it suddenly doesn't bother me now. My significant other even complained before about how little we had sex, but has never mentioned being glad that we do it more frequently now or anything. Just seems like that's how it is. There's Facebook memories that I don't remember. So sometimes I'll scroll Facebook memories, and I can remember most of them, or I can shrug them off and say, it seems like something I would have shared back then. But sometimes one will pop up that I cannot recall posting it at all. These are usually things I write out myself. What I was doing that day, or my feelings or something, which is not something I do much. But every week or so, I see one ranging from a year ago to ten or more years ago. That just makes me think, why did I post that? I don't remember saying or feeling that way at all. That's not like me, etc. There are other small changes that are less important, but these ones I take note of every day. Thanks for reading my long post. <laughs> I hope to hear people's ideas about what may be going on, or what kind of glitch I may have experienced that I've struggled with. This happened to me for the second time today, and it freaked me out. The first time it happened, I wanted to share a post here, but... I just didn't feel like it was enough on its own. I honestly don't know if this could be classed as a glitch, but the feeling I get from this when it happens is that the concept of time isn't real, or linear, and we have the ability to basically experience things from the future without even noticing until after it's happened. It sounds crazy, but I'll explain. So, here it is. And this has happened to me twice now. I am an artist, and both times this happened has been when I have an idea in my head, and I'll scour through reference images until I find the one. Not that I have an exact known building in my mind, it's just something that looks how I imagine the scene in my mind. I'll choose a building that I don't know anything about just that I like the look of. The first time was a few months ago. I was drawing an Amsterdam street scene. I had to look through various blogs, Instagram accounts, and Google searches until I found a building I felt was just right to draw. I started drawing it, and then went to make a coffee and have a quick break from drawing. I sat down with my coffee and was mindlessly flicking through Instagram stories when someone I know who lives in Amsterdam shared a photo, and what was in the background. The exact same damn house that I had just drawn. Now, I know what you're thinking. You probably think I just thought they were the same building because the canal houses often have similar features. I took two screenshots and compared everything, from the window frames, the shape of the roof, the things outside the building, the tree, the stones on the pavement, the building next door. 
it was 100% the same building. I also know Amsterdam quite well myself, and can say with 100% certainty that it is the exact same building. I messaged the guy that I know, and I said, is that a famous building or something? And he said it wasn't, and that he hadn't even specifically photographed that building. It was a regular Amsterdam building. A nice one, but nothing extraordinary compared to every other building out there. Nothing that makes it stand out more than others. I explained to him what had happened, and I showed him my screenshots and my drawing. And he was equally as freaked out, too. Please, bear in mind that this all happened within the space of an hour or less. Today, the same thing happened again with another building. Two days ago, I was scouring the internet looking for references for a London warehouse, Victorian period. I already had the idea of how it would look in my mind. I just needed to find a photograph to draw from that matched. So, I looked through hundreds of warehouses and picked one. It had a nice curved shape to the roof and some white writing on the wall that said Spratt's Patent Limited. So, I drew it. Weird fact, this warehouse was also next to a canal, so both my drawings that I'm referring to are canal scenes. Today, I was eating my dinner, and the TV was on. A still image flashed on the screen, and guess what it was? It was the exact same building that I had just drawn two days ago. Same angle, and everything. I was once again so freaked out. The program was not even anything about the building. It was just a still image that quickly flashed up to show where they were filming. Some quick statistics for you. In Amsterdam, there are believed to be around 7,000 historical canal houses. So, what made me choose this one? I can't find any estimation online of how many Victorian warehouses there are in London, but I grew up there, and I can tell you that London is full of historical buildings and warehouses and wharves. Lots of folks will just tell me it's a coincidence, but it personally, in my soul, I feel there's more to it than that. As an artist, I don't just draw anything for the sake of it. I draw things that come from my soul, and where do my ideas come from? In these instances... I can honestly tell you that I feel like my ideas must have come from the near future. Time cannot be as linear as we believe it is. I hope this makes an interesting read, and I would love to hear your thoughts or similar stories. I run a custom trim shop slash hardwood lumber yard. Both glitches involve longtime customers, guys who I know on site. The first time it happened was around 2010. We had a few contractors who did enough business with us that they had accounts. They could just sign for material rather than the usual payment on delivery model. I'm not saying all contractors are shady, but... There are a lot of fly-by-night guys who say they'll pay when the job is done, but you never hear from them again. I get that not everyone has the capital to lay out for material, but I've been burned enough to know the difference between an established business and the cash-on-delivery guys. Anyway, we'll call this customer Mr. C. One day, Mr. C comes in and his left hand is heavily bandaged. Obviously, I ask what happened. Mr. C was cutting a piece of plywood on a table saw by himself. Halfway through, it started to fall off the table. He put his hand down to push it back onto the table, and he sliced the top of his middle finger, half of his ring finger, and all of his pinky finger off. We talked about it, and agreed how table saws are the most dangerous tools, 
I actually know more guys who've been injured from nail guns, but I was being sympathetic. Anyway, I didn't see Mr. C for five or six weeks. I saw he had an order ready for pickup one day, and I made sure that I was in the shop. I wanted to say hi and check on how he was holding up after his accident. When I walked up to the loading dock, Mr. C and one of our employees were loading red oak baseboards into his box van. Mr. C was using both hands. Both fully fingered hands. I didn't say anything. I just helped them load the material into the van and made sure the paperwork was in order. After he pulled out, I said something to my employee about how I thought Mr. C had cut his fingers from his left hand. My employee just looked at me weird and said he didn't know what I was talking about. This employee knew about Mr. C's accident. He was there the day Mr. C showed up in bandages. I know that we discussed it, and nail guns. No one in the shop knew what I was talking about, so... I let it go. Mr. C officially retired a few years ago with all of his fingers. My second glitch actually had a witness. July of 2018, I was eating lunch in the break room with one of our older employees. We weren't talking, just eating our microwaved leftovers and staring at our phones. He grunts and says, oh, Mr. K died. I was taken aback, and he shows me the obituary. Mr. K had been killed in an automobile accident the previous weekend. Arrangements were scheduled at the local funeral home on Friday. I felt bad that I couldn't go to the calling hours. Mr. K had been a friend of my grandpa's. They were both carpenters. My kid had friends coming for a sleepover that night and I wasn't going to cancel it to go to calling hours for a guy that I really didn't know. My dad was going anyway, so our family was still represented. Fast forward to January of 2019, that same employee walks into the office and says he has a customer that requires my assistance. That's our usual code for, here's a Karen that we don't want to deal with. I walk out to the warehouse, and standing there is Mr. K. Longtime employee walks behind Mr. K, looking at me with his eyebrows raised so high that they're disappearing into his ball cap. I was stunned. I greeted him, shook his hand. I asked him how he'd been doing. He said he's been fine. We found the couple of boards that he needed for his project. He paid and was on his way. As he was pulling out, our employee said, I swear, I thought he was dead. Amazed that I wasn't the only one this time, I agreed. We talked for a while about how we both remember reading the obituary. I went back to the office and called my dad. I asked him if Mr. K was alive, and he said that he hadn't heard otherwise. My dad didn't remember going to a funeral. I've only talked to my employee about it one other time. We just chalked it up to an oddity. But it still weirds me out. I'll try to explain this the best that I can. It sounds inexplicable. This has never made sense to me, and I think about it on occasion because I could never figure it out. It happened about ten years ago. I don't want to say where I actually was, but it was a Midwestern town. It bothers me because it doesn't make sense. I was driving through a city of around 200,000 people, and my parents lived there and the exit to get to their house was the last one before you left the city, driving east to west. I missed the exit, and I didn't want to swerve at the last minute because there was traffic on the interstate. But then, I left the city, and anyone who lives in a Midwestern town knows that once you get past the last exit, 
you can go for miles before you even get a place that you can drive off on. So, basically, I figured I would just keep driving until I finally found a road to get off on and turn around. Anyways, I just kept driving. Then, I saw those big interstate signs that you see above you, but they were all rusted, without the signs. Just the posts. I thought maybe it was due to road construction. I thought that maybe I had missed a detour. But at this point, I was paying attention, because I needed to get around and turn back. But there weren't any places to turn around, so I just kept driving. It didn't make any sense because there weren't lights anymore, and the road was getting worn out, like it hadn't been paved in years. Then there were trees, like lots of pine trees. It didn't make sense. I was kind of starting to panic because I didn't know where I was. I was sure that I didn't take a different route. The road started to get really old and the trees were dense, which didn't make sense because this is a place with few trees. I slowed down because I was honestly scared and confused as to where I was, and I then saw some of those black and white roadblock signs just blocking the road. It did not make sense. Why would they be in the middle of the damn highway? They were just sitting there, blocking the actual interstate. I thought maybe I had gotten off the interstate, so I stopped in the middle of the road, thinking, okay, I'll just turn around. So I crossed the median and started to drive back. I felt lost, but I drove on the road and, without any turns, I came back and was on the damn same interstate. I don't get it. I turned off the exit and drove right to my parents' house. I was always on the same road and I never turned off except for the exit. I asked my parents if there was some kind of road construction going on and they said not that they knew of. I was very confused and really worried. I was so bothered by it. I kept thinking about how I was probably so aloof that it was just a mistake and I probably drove off in a different direction. When I left to go home a couple of days later, I wanted to make sure, so I went back on the exact same interstate and drove in the exact same direction. It was fine. There were no roadblocks, no trees, no nothing. I never turned off. I was always driving on the exact same road. That interstate was not the same place. I don't know, it bothers me to this day. I guess I wanted someone else's opinion as to what might have happened. P.S. I have no mental illness, I don't do drugs, I don't drink and drive. It was Sioux Falls, exit 29, on the west side of town, while I was traveling westbound on I-90. Sorry to keep adding, but I honestly believe that I was in a place that did not exist, or I wasn't supposed to be in. I can't think of any other explanation. It keeps going over my head over the years, and nothing else makes sense. I really don't know, it bothers me so much. Last weekend, I took a trip for my birthday with my partner to a small mountain town in Colorado. We're from Denver, so we drive in the mountains a lot and I'm fairly accustomed to it. We decided to take a nice drive and enjoy the scenery. If you've ever been to Colorado, you know that the weather can change quickly in the mountains. We were driving on Highway 285, through a valley that was dry with no snow, and had to pass through a tunnel on the slope up to exit the valley. The tunnel slightly sloped upwards, and there was some snow slash precipitation on the other side of the tunnel outside of the valley. 
Continuing on, we reached the peak of that set of mountains and went through a second tunnel which was quite icy. The tunnels in this stretch of land are very long and windy because they cut through the mountains. It was really icy and made my partner and myself nervous to be driving on roads in those conditions, especially with the curves. After passing through the second icy tunnel, we immediately started going downhill into another valley that was getting hit pretty hard by a snowstorm. At this point, we've both made a comment about how we were nervous that we would have to go back uphill in all of this snow, so I took the next possible turnoff and turned around to head back to our Airbnb. I'd been riding the brakes the whole way down the mountain, basically just sliding towards where I wanted to go and hoping no animals jumped out in front of us. At this point, we'd probably driven about half a mile, all downhill, into the base of this valley. We ended up turning around in a ski area parking lot, so I know we were at the base of the valley because we were at the base of the ski lifts. Logically, we had driven downhill to get into the base of the valley, and both my partner and I have vivid memories of driving downhill and being notably nervous about backtracking in the snow. I turned our car around specifically because we were going downhill too much, and we were dreading the difficulties we might face going back up. However, here is where we experienced the glitch. After I turned around at the ski area parking lot, we headed back towards our Airbnb. We both were holding our breaths because the snow was heavy, roads were slick, and we were about to go up a slippery mountain. But I never, never had to take my foot off the brake. Again. While I rode the brakes the entire way into the valley before turning around, I rode my brakes the entire way back to the icy tunnel. When I say rode my brakes, I mean I had to literally pump my brakes to stop from sliding out on the steep, slippery mountainside. I didn't touch the gas pedal once. When we got to the icy tunnel, I knew that we had somehow gotten up the mountain by going downhill. We both audibly questioned if this was the correct tunnel. Did we go the wrong way? Was this the right tunnel? Had we been going downhill the whole time? No, really, we were going downhill. Why are we still going downhill? We both were absolutely shocked. There was no doubt that we went downhill in both directions. We both were so nervous about our circumstances because we were sliding down a mountain into a valley. We also turned around at a ski lift area, which are at the bases of the mountains. It had to be downhill to get there. But when we left the valley, we just slid back out on another downslope. Sure enough, a short distance later, we went through the first tunnel and were back in our original valley. We were at our Airbnb in no time, and most definitely did not take a wrong turn. Honestly, we were both pretty grateful for it, the glitch. It was a scary situation that came at us fast. We feared being stuck at the bottom of a snowy valley, but made it home easily on a glitch. Hey Raven, it's JJJ. I decided to share this story because it's kind of been itching at me since I found these videos. So, this was back when I was in the fifth grade, when our teacher was absent. I have no clue why, it's been a while. We had a substitute who was this young lady with brown hair and green eyes. I'll call her Miss Clark for this story. So... Miss Clark introduced herself, and then set us off in groups to do our work. Then, lunch came, and went, and we returned to our class, and when I looked up at the teacher, I was a little confused. 
there's this older woman with grayish hair and dark brown eyes. At first, I thought that there was a sub-switch, but I looked at her name tag and it still said Miss Clark, with the same first name, spelled the same. I looked at my friend that I'll call Sean, who also looked confused at what he was seeing while everyone else seemed not to notice this weird change. After the initial shock wore off, I just decided to go on with the day, and did, until the end of the day. I walked past Miss Clark in the hallway, the original Miss Clark that I saw earlier. I ran to my bus and kept my head down until I got home. I still think about this, and I even discuss it with Sean from time to time. I'm a male in my early 60s, and the following occurrence happened about 20 years ago on a semi-rural road in northeast Ohio, about 5 miles northeast of the Akron Canton Airport. My wife and I were taking a casual Sunday afternoon ride on the Harleys when we turned onto a one and a half mile long stretch of road heading north away from the airport. I happened to glance up to my left, and I noticed a commercial jet airplane, which would have been passing by heading southwest towards the airport in a descending slope. It was fairly close to us, and it would have been about as big as your pinky finger held out at arm's length. I didn't notice right away, but as we proceeded to pass by this plane, it slowly became apparent that it was not moving as a normal plane should. In fact, it appeared to be standing still in midair. I yelled at my wife to check that plane out, and we pulled over to a stop since there were no other cars on the road. That plane hung right where it was the entire time that we sat there, for two to three minutes. My very tech-challenged wife seemed to think that jet planes do that sort of thing all the time. Not in my universe, they don't. I did some poking around the internet, and I found a few videos that people have of the same thing happening to them. I have never forgotten my experience with a glitch in the Matrix. I was on a French exchange when I was 12 years old, and I dreamed of a place that seemed important at the time, if you know what I mean. It was stylized, but when I moved continents at 30 and started working at a large software company in the Pacific Northwest, I'd never even visited the US before, the campus was instantly recognizable. In the cafeteria with outdoor tables, the small offices with phones and futons, and even the unnaturally steep waterfall. It turned out that it was because it was unnatural, who would have guessed, and made it unmistakable. Even my office mate, a Mormon, had that same puzzled feeling that I had, and said that even though it wasn't in accordance with Mormon doctrine, he was sure we had met somewhere before, and that I was exactly where I should be right now. Assuming it's not just some fantastically wild coincidence, the alternative is even more disturbing. The site had not been built when I was 12. It simply didn't exist. In the series of events that led me there, initially, that was the last company that I wanted to work for, were an incredible series of coincidences and spontaneous decisions. So, if this were the case, where does that leave free will? If I was going to be there to the extent of some kind of future memory, how much actual choice did I have in those intervening 30 years, if it all led here? Have we already made all the choices and this is just us watching them play out like reading a book after you've written it? Mm -hmm. 
my boyfriend and I were supposed to go to a wedding together, but he's a very antisocial person, so I went alone. He jokingly told me not to pick up anyone at the reception, and I laughed it off. Why would something like that happen? It turned out, at the party, I was standing next to a very engaging guy who started to flirt with me. We had a great deal in common, and we ended up sitting at the bride and groom's table together. I was having a really great time, and was feeling a little guilty about how much I was enjoying the company of this guy. However, at one point, I decided to excuse myself to go to the bathroom. I pushed my chair back, and he reached out his arm to steady me, and my hand went to his shoulder. As I did that, just as you would see in the movies with memories, I literally saw my entire life flash before my eyes with he and I in it. I saw us fall in love, marry, have children, face separation, divorce, everything. It happened at a rapid speed, yet I could feel every emotion of every moment. I removed my hand from his shoulder, and he looked at me and smiled. No time had passed during that flashback. No one seemed to notice but me. Needless to say, I was absolutely confused. Years later, I met him in a capacity to actually ask him about that day, and he was nonplussed, so... I never told him anything about it. A few years ago, I lived in a cul-de-sac in a small, safe suburb. The kind where you're passively friendly with your neighbors. Across from my house was a little red house where lived a man in his late 30s, Ron, his wife, and their two young children. Our children would play together in the street, we would exchange favors and Christmas cards, etc., and so our families were somewhat close. In the blue house beside them lived Ron's parents, which I always thought was nice that they could see each other often. One early summer evening, while still fully light out, the weather was nice, so I was out on my front porch to relax for a moment. I see Ron walking out of his parents' blue house, telling them goodbye. He's carrying a gallon of milk in his left hand. No bag, just the milk. I thought, how convenient that he can borrow milk from his parents next door instead of having to just go buy it. I didn't call out to him as I figured he was busy. He walked into his little red house and shut the door. Maybe a minute later, Ron's car pulls up into the driveway. I thought nothing of it until, to my surprise, Ron himself gets out of the car. In his left hand, he's holding a yellow plastic grocery bag that I recognize as being from the corner store up the block. The bag is transparent so I can see inside a gallon of milk. Being confused, I again decided not to call out to him. He again walked into his little red house and shut the door behind him. I imagine at home his wife had asked him to go get milk, and through some strange glitch, he did. Twice. In two different ways. I wonder if that evening his wife found two gallons of milk in the kitchen. I live in the Caribbean, and I was home alone this day. Uh, consider an L-shaped space facing the other way. I was sitting in the kitchen table, and just off of that space you can see right out to the drying yard where we hang sheets and laundry sometimes to save on the light bill. The room before that is the laundry room. I got up and went to the kitchen, and then thought that I might put out some laundry that was hanging in that room. 
I took up the key that was hanging on the wall outside the laundry and considered opening the gates to the drying yard to put said laundry out. But then, I decided not to bother, as I could see that the sky was overcast. Instead, I just left the keys on the ironing board. I remember having an internal monologue with myself about this decision, and then I went back to the kitchen. Here is where the story gets odd. I got a call from my cousin in Canada, and as he spoke to me, all the pores raised on my body. It was not what he had said to me, but the fact that as he was speaking to me, something made me walk with the phone to the hallway between the laundry room and the drying yard. The gate was wide open, and the keys were where I left them. Needless to say, I cut the conversation short and retraced my steps a few times. I have no idea how this happened. The thing about moments like this is that they seem way too small and insignificant to be real. However, this happened in such a blink that I cannot believe that I'm wrong. The gate always makes a sound when you open it. It's a wrought iron gate, and the lock is a tricky one that demands that you jiggle it a few times just to open it. Surely, if I had opened it in that nanosecond, I would have remembered doing it. When I was 15 or 16, my two younger brothers and I were playing in our family's living room. For some reason that I don't recall, our parents weren't there at the time, so we were basically playing dodgeball in the house only. Instead of the heavy rubber balls typically used in actual dodgeball, we were using one of the cheap, lightweight, inflatable rubber balls from Walmart. You know the type. Smaller than a standard basketball. I'm guessing it was between 12 to 14 inches in circumference. There was a grandfather clock positioned in one corner of the room that my mom still has to this day. It was positioned as close to the wall as possible. When you take into account the baseboard and shoe molding on the wall, plus the trim on the bottom of the clock, there couldn't have been more than a four to five inch gap between the body of the clock and the sheetrock wall. We were launching this ball at each other, because no matter how hard you throw these, they don't hurt the other person. So I get the ball and throw it as hard as I can at my brother, who was standing in front of the clock. Just as the ball left my hand, I had this snapshot vision in my head of that ball lodging between the clock and the wall, and in slow motion, I watched my brother jump out of the way, and that 12-inch ball bury itself in the 4-inch space between the clock and the wall, just like it had happened in my mind a split second before. I don't mean a little either. Nearly half of the ball was lodged. It was difficult to pull free. All three of us stopped and were blown away by what had just happened. It had to be a 1 in 10 million shot. I'm fairly certain that I could try to do it again for the rest of my life, and would likely never be able to do it again. To get to the kitchen from my old bedroom at my mom's house, you had to walk down a small hallway and pass my sister's room. At the time, my sister was a baby and still sleeping in a crib. One day as I was walking past my sister's room to the kitchen, I spotted my mom leaning over the crib peering down at her. I quickly changed course and headed for the room to ask my mom a question, but before I even took two steps in her direction, she looked up at me, put her finger over her lips indicating to be quiet, and my sister was napping, and made another hand gesture shooing me away. So I turned back around and walked straight to the kitchen. However, when I got to the kitchen, my mom was standing there making sandwiches. 
stunned. I asked her if she was just in my sister's room and told her what I had seen, but she said she hadn't been in there for about 20 minutes. Of course, when we went to check out the room, nothing was out of place, and my sister was still sleeping. This has always puzzled me and melts my mind when I think about it too much. I literally saw my mother in the baby's room, had a, a brief non-verbal interaction with her, and then about ten seconds later saw her again in the kitchen, and she had no recollection of the first incident. It was broad daylight, and no one else was home except us three. Given the layout of the house, there is absolutely no way anyone could have come in or out without us noticing, since the doors to both the front yard and backyard are visible from the kitchen, where my mom was standing making us lunch. I've never been able to rationally explain this experience, and I often wonder what would have happened if I ignored her gestures and continued on into the room. When I was 16 years old, I used to drive a scooter to my school. I always used to put my wallet in cabinet of my back seat, which we refer to as Dicky in our country. One fine day, after leaving the school, when I opened Dickie of my scooter, I realized that my wallet was gone. I panicked, and not only because my wallet had money in it, but it also contained a photo of my then-girlfriend, and I didn't want some stranger to get a hold of her photo. I checked my compartment again and again, but the wallet was nowhere to be found. That night... I told my girlfriend about this incident, and she even panicked and scolded me for keeping her photo in my wallet, and then carelessly keeping the wallet in the dicky of Scooter, which I parked in my school parking lot. Thankfully, the parking lot had many CCTV cameras which were working 24-7, so the next day after taking permission to review the footage... I went to the CCTV room and fast-forwarded the footage of the previous day. I watched the footage from the moment I parked to the moment I left the premise. Nothing to be found. I even told one of our lecturers the same thing, and the same day he too checked the back seat of the scooter and even ordered the watchmen to look up in the parking lot and also took me to Lost and Found of my school, but nothing. Three days later, I had given up and made peace that my wallet had been stolen, and so was the photo of my girlfriend. But, all of a sudden, that day after leaving school, I saw my wallet in my dickie. It had the exact same amount of money. None of it was stolen, not even the coins. And most importantly, the photo was also there. I found my wallet in the same condition. I told the watchman that I had found my wallet and he laughingly said that someone might have pulled a prank on me. I just believed him and decided to change the lock of my scooter, which I did, and nothing like this ever happened again afterwards. I don't know how and why, but I still remember each and every detail of that event, and no one believes me when I tell them this story. They think that I just didn't search enough, or simply that I've made it up. I've sent you three stories already, and all of them happened to me. I'm so grateful to finally be able to send them to someone who may be able to add them to their other stories, and produce some plausible explanations for all of it. My first time slip experience happened when I was a child. I was about 12 and I went to a church bazaar with my aunt. We were walking around taking part in the usual things, games, buying cake or ice cream, and we circled back a few times to one area where a lot of men were gambling to get some very expensive prize. My auntie looked at me and said, You're a very lucky person. Let's try your luck at what they're doing. 
I remember looking at her and saying, Are you sure? Those men are trying to win alcohol. Will they let me play? She said not to worry, and we walked over. The game in question required you to match the right card with the one under the expensive array of bottles of alcohol. We'd stood up long enough to see what was causing the frenzy. However, when she said what she said to me, we walked over towards the game itself. As I stood up and looked at the entire layout of all the bottles and the cards, I felt as though I was watching every single card facing up. It was so absurd that I didn't even hesitate. I just said, of course, that one. I didn't need to take several turns. I did it right away. I won the expensive alcohol. The game came to a shuddering end of great disappointments to all of who were gambling. My aunt was vindicated in seeing me as lucky. I'll never forget how easy it seemed. The cards in my mind were all revealed, and I just knew what to do. As if I had always known. I've had one more experience like that as an adult, and I always wonder what it would take to do it again. What I do know is the time seems to slow down completely, and you have to be very calm and very clear about what you're going to do, and then absolutely ignore everything else. I make deliveries on Cape Cod. In the spring of 2016, I was delivering in the Yarmouth slash Dennis area when I suddenly found myself driving down a bumpy road through the woods. I usually just zone out while driving and blindly follow my GPS, so I had no idea where I was. After driving for a while, the road widened and became a suburban neighborhood. Around a corner, I came across a stucco house with a big palm tree planted in the front yard. Later research revealed it to be a windmill palm that is tolerant of colder weather. It looked straight out of Florida. This is not a sight typically seen in Massachusetts. So, I turned around, and I recorded a video driving by and posted it to my Snap story. If you aren't familiar with Snapchat, Anything you post on your story is automatically deleted after 24 hours if you don't save it. And I did not save it. After driving off for a bit, I came upon a familiar area and made a mental note of where that palm tree was, so I could find it another time. Back then, I wasn't delivering at Cape Cod consistently, so I didn't go back to that area for about a year. When I did, I tried to find it again so I could see how the palm tree head up, and the street that I could have sworn it was on was a dead end. I thought I was only mistaken, so I drove around a bit looking for it, but to no avail. Later on, I used Google Earth to scour the area for this house, and I looked everywhere. I looked at all the surrounding towns, I searched for hours over several weeks, I used Street View... I went back and looked at historical imagery from that year, and nothing. Not only does the house not exist, but the road as I remembered it doesn't seem to exist. I searched social media to see if anyone could have posted about this very curious house on Cape Cod, but nothing comes up. I searched the local newspaper to see if there was an article written about it. I've asked my employees who deliver in that area if they have seen it. I've asked locals if they knew about it. Nothing. It's as if it never existed. And it's wild. I traveled back in time approximately 15 minutes this morning. As the title says, this happened this morning. I have a job where I work the graveyard shift from 4am until I'm done with my work. 
There was a Valentine's Day rush, so I didn't get out until around 6.30. I went back to my apartment to catch another hour or two of sleep before my 9 o'clock class. I live within close walking distance, so I set my alarm for 8.40. 8.40 rolls around, and my alarm goes off. I always put my phone underneath my pillow so that I feel the vibrations against my face. When I picked up my phone to turn it off, I noticed a few notifications from my friend, A, messaging me on Instagram and dated 14 minutes ago. I pressed snooze on my alarm for another 10 minutes of sleep, figuring I can still make my class if I hurry. I live about 10 minutes away, but I was still in my work clothes. The snoozed alarm goes off, and I was still tired as hell, so I decided not to go and to text my friend about it later to make sure I didn't miss anything important. I put my phone down by my legs when I was done, silencing my alarm. More time passes, and another alarm goes off. I'm confused because I don't have another alarm after my initial one to wake up and go to class. I grabbed my phone, which was still by my legs, and I saw that it was 8.40 again. I'm still super tired at this point, so it took me a minute to fully realize what had happened. I was hesitant at first to actually wake up because some crazy crap just happened, but I don't want to mess with whatever made it happen. After a few minutes, I figured that the universe had given me a second chance to get to class, so... I got up. On my way to class, I was thinking about it some more, and I was about to chalk it up to a weird dream that I had already woken up. But then I remembered my Instagram messages from A. I didn't see the notifications when I woke up the second time, so I checked my DMs. Sure enough, A messaged me at 826. 14 minutes before 8.40 when I initially woke up. Okay, so I haven't thought about this in years, but this sub uh, brought this incident back to the forefront of my mind. It was July 4th of 2011, and obviously in the U.S., that's Independence Day, so I got together with a group of friends to go out. But because the 4th of July was on a weekday that year, I had an early shift the following day, so I decided that I shouldn't get drunk. The night was fun, but around 8, I decided I should try to get back to my side of town before the fireworks started, because I figured traffic and people drunk driving would get worse if I stayed at my friend's house until after the fireworks. So, I'm driving up this narrow side street going up towards my house. But, this side street is one many of the locals use to get from my neighborhood to our south side, which is a major drinking and partying hotspot. Anyway... I had on this very distinctive and obnoxious American flag shirt, where the Badis part had red and white stripes, and the arms were blue with white stars. I bought the shirt from a thrift store, and I had never seen anyone wear something similar, but who knows. Anyway, as I'm driving down this street, I see what looks like a woman with a similar shirt as mine passed out face down on the sidewalk. Like... She looked like something was seriously wrong, too. Like she had face planted into the ground or something. So I decided to pull over and go and check on her, but because the street is so narrow, you can't just double park. You have to go and find a place to pull over. So I park down the block and go back to help this lady. I've been down this road many times throughout my life, so I know the landmarks well and I knew exactly where she had been laying. Also, even though I had to park down the street, I literally ran back to her, so it couldn't have been more than three or four minutes max. 
so I get to where I knew I saw her, and there's nothing. No sign of anyone, no one walking down the street or anything. It was so bizarre, and I got the chills. So, I decided to just drop it and go back to my car. As I'm getting ready to cross the street again, this car comes speeding up the street towards me, and before I could even think, it crashes smack into the retaining wall right by where I was standing, just literally seconds before. Then this nutjob backs out and drives off. So one of the neighbors comes out and we call the police, and I helped file a police report and then went home. When I got home, I called my mom to tell her about what happened because I was still so shaken up, and she's the one who started putting things together, and made me really think about this as if it's a glitch in the matrix. She felt like I had somehow witnessed some alternative reality where I saw myself dead on the sidewalk, because in that reality, maybe a car struck me earlier than the car that had arrived in this dimension. I don't know. I didn't really know what to make of it then, and I suppose that I still don't, but coming here on Reddit today makes me think it was maybe just another glitch in the Matrix. More bizarre, less creepy story, but it one that still lingers in the back of my mind to this day. It was only two years ago, so it's still a pretty fresh memory. I was taking a walk around my neighborhood because the weather was nice, and decided it would be nice to get a little cardio in. So, I left my house at about 1 in the afternoon, and made my way to the local high school. I decided I would walk to the campus, then double back and head home. It's a decent distance away, so... Going to and from was ideal for a walk. After about 20 minutes, I was a block away from the campus and could view the top of the building from where I was. There I was, at almost the corner closest to the school, a block away. At that corner, a black, slim car turned the corner, passed me, and drove down the street. However, I'm a very anxious and bored person, so the minute I noticed people, of course I would be interested in the micro-journey that I was witnessing. In other words, I turned my head to watch the car after only a few seconds of it turning the corner. The car was gone. Completely vanished. Note that I'm still at the far corner of a city block, which means that there should still be a good 20 seconds or so before the car can even turn again. Not to mention, why would the car turn? If it wanted to go to my right instead of my left, it could just keep driving straight. Sure, he could just have a house on that side of the block, but I felt it a worthy thing to mention. Puzzled, I stood there for a few seconds before turning back around and continuing forward. Another strange thing caught my eye then, an old woman watering her garden off to my right. Okay, cool, I wasn't the only witness. However, I shook my head and just assumed that all of that was just a coincidence. I looked straight ahead again, towards the school, only for that same car to be turning right in front of me again, passing me, again, vanishing, again, once my eyes had followed suit as it left my immediate vision. Now it was weird. The same black car had turned this same corner and vanished behind me for a split few seconds. It wasn't in the view twice now. It was such an anomaly. I had never witnessed things like this before, and I haven't since. But some things to note. There's no way that it's an optical illusion where the car just barely manages to look like it's vanished by hiding behind another car closer in view. The city block was stretched far enough that I could still see anything in the road. Not to mention, there were no parked cars in the street immediately to my side. Of course, there were a few sprinkled about, but 
nothing directly next to me. It was not a dream. I'm just reviewing as a memory on accident. The amount of detail is too much for someone like me who constantly forgets dreams. I was not deep in thought, nor listening to music, just going with the flow of my walk. I was focusing more on the heat than anything else. That means there's no way the time just passed a lot faster than I thought, unless I was just really intensely paying attention to the sky or the school. There's no room to explain that. I wasn't exactly paying attention to the noises around me, and I have no recollection of car engines. Sorry. So, any thoughts? I apologize in advance if this comes across as rambling. I'm just at my wit's end and don't know what to do. It started a few months ago. I would put something down and walk away and come back a few moments later, and it wouldn't be there. It would either be in a completely different place, or would just seemingly cease to exist. I chalked it up to being sleep deprived. My partner and I both work nights, and absent-mindedly doing things or just misremembering in general. Then, it got weirder. I was getting ready for a date night and wanted to take a shower, but couldn't find my shaving cream anywhere. My shaving cream bottle is all white with a purple cap. I own nothing that looks similar to that in any way, and neither does my partner. He helped me search our small bathroom for over an hour trying to find it. Pulling everything out of the linen closet in the bathroom, checking every drawer and even the cabinet under the sink. We could not find it anywhere. After putting everything away and returning the counter around the sink to normal, I was confused but thought maybe I'd run out and just forgotten that I had used the last of it. My partner leaves the bathroom, closing the door behind him, and I hop in the shower. After 20 minutes, I finish up and get out, only to find the shaving cream sitting in the middle of our pink sink. I called for my partner and he was just as confused as I was. We argued for a few minutes because I thought he was messing with me, but he was insistent that he hadn't snuck back in during my shower to place it in the sink and was genuinely upset that I thought he would mess with me like that. I apologized and we moved on from it, but it still bothered me when I would think about it. Fast forward a month, and on Saturday he heads to work like normal. I start to get hungry and I decide to make French toast. I get everything set up and ready, pulling out a plate and putting my slices of bread on it before whipping together the eggs and milk. Getting my pan and spatula ready, I pull the butter out of the fridge and place it on the counter next to the plate. Right before I turned the stove on, I felt nature's call and headed to the bathroom to pee really quick before continuing. Our dog follows me and is hanging out while I do my thing and no more than two minutes later, I'm back in the kitchen turning the stove on. I turn to grab the butter off of the counter and it's just... gone. Not there. I tried not to jump to conclusions. I checked the fridge seven times. I checked the cabinets that I had gone in to grab out what I needed to make the French toast. I even checked the trash can to see if I had accidentally tossed it out when I got rid of the eggshells. No signs of the missing butter. The cat has never stolen anything off the counter before, but I figured it was a more rational explanation than the butter just ceasing to exist. I went to see if she had smuggled it off and found her asleep on the couch, butter free. I know the dog couldn't have taken it, because she was with me the entire time that I was out of the kitchen. I freaked out a bit. I started messaging my friends in our group chat about what was going on, and one of them FaceTimed me to help me recheck everywhere in case I just wasn't seeing it. 
I ended up having a panic attack after 30 minutes of searching over this call with no signs of the butter. We retraced every step I had taken, and even looked in the bathroom to see if I had brought it with me. I cleaned up everything I had taken out and refused to go back into the kitchen out of fear of the butter reappearing somewhere I had searched that my friend confirmed was butterless. It's been days now, and I still haven't found the butter or even a wrapper to prove that it existed. I tried to talk to my partner about it, and he thought maybe it was carbon monoxide poisoning. But we checked our detector, and it was working normally, so it doesn't appear to be that. I feel like I'm going crazy. Okay, so I'm making this post after telling people of my original experience, Where Did I Go?, which is the story in this video prior to this story. I really didn't want to explain this one, because I felt like it would just make my other experience less believable, but it really does bother me. This is one of the only two strange experiences I've ever had. I explained how I had an experience in the Midwest. This also took place in the Midwest. This time, I was diverted on some obvious road construction around a town of about 10,000 people. So I took the detour. It was around 11 or 12 at night. I just kept driving wherever the marker sent me. Anyone who has experienced road construction in the Midwest knows how this is. Random markers telling you to go every which way. I get how anyone could get lost. So I was just going along the road signs. Somehow I must have gotten mixed up. I ended up on this giant bridge. Nothing on top, just a road above everything. I looked down, and I saw lots of lights, like it was some sort of industrial area. But there were no people. At all. I didn't think it was too strange at the time. I thought maybe I was just driving over a power plant or something like that. But then... I got to the end of the bridge, and I didn't see any more signs. It was a town. But it looked run down, but not extremely old. I kind of wanted to stop and maybe ask someone where to go to get back onto the highway. There was no activity at all, though. I pulled into this parking lot, and the building looked like it hadn't been touched in ten or more years. I was kind of hoping that someone would drive by. It was super eerie. There was literally no one. No cars. Nothing. It felt really strange. Even late at night, I'd figure that I would see a light somewhere. I kept looking around, but everything was dark. All the buildings looked like they hadn't been touched in 10 or 20 years. I got a really bad feeling like I was not supposed to be here. Towns close down, I get it, but they are not supposed to look like this. This was around 2012, and those buildings looked like they hadn't been touched since the 90s. I decided I should just go, retrace my steps, and maybe get back to where I was. I went back across the huge bridge, and after I made it across the bridge, I turned off and then saw the detour signs again. I was so relieved, I made it back on the highway. When I went back home, I was visiting my parents for a few days, I tried to find where the hell I was at. I could never find that place again. There was no giant bridge, no town that looked 20 years old and abandoned. I've searched and driven through the area multiple times. It doesn't exist, and it bothers me. P.S. This is the second and only one of two odd experiences I've had. Again, I've never done drugs, I have no history of mental illness, and I don't drink and drive. I have no other strange experiences beyond these two, and I'll answer any questions that I can. 
and edit, I truly do believe that this was some sort of glitch in the Matrix, and it makes sense to me to post it here. Okay, so I was 19 at the time, 23 now, and I was attending a youth group club with my sibling who was 17. We both went there every week and had made friends with the majority of the group. We're waiting in the lobby area at the end of the group around 8pm, just talking and hanging out for the rest of our friends. The plan was to go for milkshakes after town. Then, a different group walks past us. This was weird. Firstly, at this time of night on a Thursday, the only people left in the building are part of the youth group that meet in a specific room on the first floor. The rest of the building is for employees working as social workers and such. So neither my sibling nor I had seen or even recognized these people. They were teenagers, and I very distinctly remember one person with neon blue headphones, another with the violin case, and two others laughing loudly and pushing each other around. First time they go by, literally right past us, almost brushing my shoulder. They all stare ahead and don't look or seem to notice me or my sibling. A few minutes go by and we're still waiting on our friends. It's only a short walk down the stairwell to get to the lobby, so it's weird that they're taking so long. Then, that same group of people walk past us again. Both my sibling and I had seen them exit the building and cross a road leading into town, yet it was the same person with neon headphones, the same person carrying the violin, and the same two others laughing and shoving each other as they walked. This time, I try to say hey to get their attention, and they turn but stare past us. I can't meet their eyes, and both me and my sibling are confused, shocked, and freaked out. Just like before, the group walks out of the building and out of view. I check with my sibling that they had seen it too. Then, five minutes go by and I get a call from one of my friends, the one that we were waiting for this whole time. Yeah, so, turns out, our friends had walked past us only a few minutes after we had gotten to the lobby first. They thought we had joined them on the way out. There was only one way out of the building at night, and we would have seen them. Our friends didn't see the other group leaving the building either. We never saw them go to the youth group ever, and we just never saw them again. This still gives me the creeps. This happened to me yesterday, and I still can't explain it logically. I was at a local store looking for a particular notebook that I had found on the store's website. I first searched the section with all the other notebooks. They had a wide selection, but I couldn't find the one that I was looking for, despite the website saying that it was in stock at that location. I figured that it must be an error and decided to order it online instead, and began to walk around, just looking at other things before I went home. Eventually, I made it to the section with the exercise equipment, pretty much on the opposite side of the store from where the notebooks are. A couple of things at the end of an aisle caught my eye, and I stopped to look. I was probably standing there for a minute or two comparing products and prices. All of a sudden, I heard a loud thud to my left. I looked over, and a 15-pound dumbbell had fallen off the shelf of the next aisle over. I was at least five to six feet away, and I had come from the other direction, so there's no way that I could have caused it to fall in any way. The next closest person it was a lady walking towards me from the other side. She was approximately the same distance from the aisle as I was, 
and had not yet passed the aisle from where the weight had fallen. It wasn't busy in the store, and nobody else had come near in the time that I had been standing there. The lady and I gave each other a confused, startled look, and I said something along the lines of, I wonder how that could have happened. And I walked over to put the weight back on the shelf. I picked up the weight, and I noticed that it had a flat section on the bottom to prevent it from rolling, which made it seem even more strange that it had fallen. But that wasn't the weirdest part. When I set it back on the shelf next to the other weights, guess what was right beside it? That exact notebook that I had been looking for. If that weight hadn't fallen, I almost certainly would have walked right past that section without noticing the notebook. I wasn't even looking for it anymore, and I definitely didn't expect to find it in the exercise section. I don't know if this quite qualifies as a glitch, or if it's more paranormal or supernatural, but it was definitely a weird, albeit a nice, surprise. I experienced a time glitch about five years ago, and I'm still trying to figure out if there's a rational explanation. At the time, I was working in an office in Cork City Center, and the car park I used was over a kilometer away. There were a few different routes from the office to the car park, but it was all uphill on the way back to the car. If I took the shortest route, and really rushed practically ran, on a nice day it would take at least nine minutes. If I walked at usual pace, it would take up to 14 minutes as there are several roads that need to be crossed. The day in question, I left the office along with three of my work colleagues. We left at bang on 5 p.m. I checked with the others later and yes, we left at exactly 5 p.m. The four of us walked part of the way together, and then the other three branched off as they used another nearer and more expensive car park. At the time, I used my walk to the car park to practice mindfulness. I tuned into my surroundings, listened to the sounds, looked at the people, experienced being in the moments, etc., etc., I remember climbing the steep stone steps at Kayser's Quay, beside Elizabeth Fort, and the next thing I was aware of was rounding the corner onto Tower Street. I got into my car totally confused. There was a big gap on my route. I got into my car, and the time in my car was showing as 17.07. Same on my watch. I turned on the car radio and time check announced of seven minutes past five. I could not have gotten there that fast, particularly as the first part of the walk included chatting with three work colleagues. I racked my memory for the walk to the car, and there is a huge gap. I have no memory at all of walking along several streets. What is particularly strange is that one of my neighbors works in a dentist surgery along the route, and I would have usually waved in the window at her as I passed. So I would always look to see if she was still working, but I have no memory whatsoever of that section of the route. I would also add that Cork City is pretty old, and the area that I was walking in is one of the oldest sections. Did I walk into some time loop and... It gets spat out in a different place. I've thought about this over and over, but I cannot explain it. At the time, ten years ago or so, I was working as a laborer doing home renovations with my cousin-in-law. We were completely gutting a basement and renovating it for a family. 
I never went upstairs, and we just used the side entrance to get into the basement. My cousin-in-law was closer with the family, though, and often went upstairs to discuss things with the family, because he was in charge of the job. The family was renovating it because they were having their niece from out of town come to live with them, because it was closer to her university but I had no idea at the time why they were renovating it. I just never asked, nor did I see or know about their niece. So, one night, I have a dream where I'm out somewhere standing in a circle together with my family, and we're all looking at a map in order to figure out which direction we should take to go home. Suddenly, This girl comes up to us and asks if I can give her a ride home. I asked her where she lives, and she says, Catherine. I'm from Toronto, so in my dream, I'm thinking that she must mean St. Catherine's, which is a town near Niagara Falls, about an hour and a half away from Toronto. I told her, sorry, but it's too far, and so she just leaves dream is over. The next day, I go into work early in the morning, and I see the niece of the family for the first time ever. Previously, I never knew she even existed. She's coming out of the front door as I'm walking past it to go to the side entrance. So, we walk past each other. I look at her and am shocked, because she's the girl in my dream. She's also really attractive, and I wanted to talk to her, but in that moment of shock, I'm speechless as she passes by me. So, the day goes on, and I told my cousin-in-law that she was in my dream last night, and everything that happened in my dream. He kind of just brushes it off and says that's interesting, and that, but she's from Quebec, not St. Catharines. At the end of the day, I hear the voice of a girl coming from the main floor, and I excitingly ask my cousin-in-law if she's home yet, as he had been upstairs a few times that day. And he replies, No, that's her sister, Catherine. Then, we both look at each other in shock of what he just said. I'm a senior at college, and I've had the same backpack since my freshman year. It's a simple gray leather backpack with three compartments, and one small compartment with a zipper inside the biggest one. It also doesn't have any cloth lining on the inside. The incidents have only started happening this week. On Monday... I put a new lipstick in the smallest compartment where I usually put my makeup and stationery. I didn't use it or even take it out the whole morning, and when I tried using it in the afternoon, I couldn't find it anywhere in my bag. The only other person who had access to my bag was my best friend, and he's a guy who doesn't use makeup at all. The two of us turned my whole bag inside out, and when we couldn't find the lipstick, he suggested that I probably forgot it at home, and I must have just thought that I took it with me. I agreed, but when I got home, I still could not find the lipstick anywhere. I was so adamant about finding it, because I had just bought it last week, and it was kind of expensive. Fast forward to yesterday... We were having coffee with some friends before our classes started for the day. I myself hadn't even opened my bag after leaving the house, and it was literally on my back the whole time. I opened it to get my wallet, and the first thing I see in there is the lipstick. I immediately showed it to my best friend, and we were shocked because we had both turned the stupid thing inside out the previous day, and I'd even texted him that night telling him I hadn't found the lipstick at home. If this was the only time it had happened, I probably wouldn't have given it too much afterthought. 
on my way home yesterday, I bought a pack of cigarettes. I'm trying to quit, but it's hard, I won't lie. And I kept it in my bag. Me and my best friend smoked a few, and there were at least six left. I even remembered thinking that I won't have to buy another pack for the night. And then I got home, tried to smoke one, and could not find the whole pack. I texted my friend asking if he accidentally took it, but he said he was sure he saw me put it back into my bag. And just like the lipstick, I found the cigarette pack in my bag again this morning. I live with my aunt. She works a lot, and we're barely ever home at the same time, so it couldn't have been her. That, and the fact that she never goes into my room... It doesn't really wear makeup at all, she's a nurse, and she doesn't smoke. I really don't know what to make of it all, but in my own theory, unless something paranormal randomly decided to start messing with me, there's a pocket dimension in my backpack where things get teleported for a day. I've been thinking about it so much, and I just had to share it somewhere. This happened over 30 years ago, and is something I have spoken about only to people that I trust. I've never been able to explain it. I was in college in New York, and my best friend came to visit me. I suggested that we go to a museum that I had to visit for a class assignment, and he was game to go. We set out to the subway, but we were arguing with each other. It was so silly, but serious, that I got into one subway car and he got into the car next to the one I got into. The door closed and I was still mad at him. But I thought about how silly it was to get mad at my friend who'd come all the way to spend time with me. Neither of us were sitting in our cars, but standing holding on to the metal poles that are independent of the chairs. I looked through the window between the cars as I was lamenting my behavior, and I saw him looking back at me. I remember thinking that, when the car stopped, I was going to hop out of my car and go over to his and apologize. The train came to the next station seconds later, but I was feeling too proud to apologize first. So, the doors closed, and I decided I would wait for the next station. I looked into the other car, and again he was looking at me, annoyed, still. However, I did record in my mind that he was dressed differently. This was the start of thinking that something was up. Prior to this, I'd only had one or two time slip experiences that were way less elaborate than this. The train stopped, and this time my heart was racing as I jumped out, and rushed over to his car to see whether he was in it. I recall a few people in the other car looking at me strangely, and needless to say, the experience was way, way, way too strange for me to continue to the museum, and I took the train back home. My mind was racing with, what did I just experience? When I got home, I was so antsy and weirded out by what I experienced I just sat out on the porch. An hour later, my friend was casually walking down the street towards me. He was wearing what I recalled him wearing when we first parted and stepped onto the train. I ran up to him and hugged him super tightly, and started to get really hysterical. I just kept hugging him and pelting questions at him. Where were you? What happened? Did you get on to the train? He looked at me very surprised, telling me that when I hopped on the train, he decided that he was not going to go, and just never got on to that train. I told him that I saw him as plain as day on the train, and I explained what he was wearing. We didn't say much more about it after that. He died six months later. I would experience something else with him before his passing, 
and I really appreciate this place to write this experience because it must be recorded. Last year, I had my sights set on studying via distance learning. Online, for anyone who doesn't know. The subject was in the fields of criminology and criminal-slash-forensic psychology. I had looked over a few unis that offered that kind of thing for the courses that I wanted to do, and I fleetingly looked at the open university, but I couldn't find what I wanted and ended up opting for another educational body-slash-faculty. Unfortunately, at the time, my mother was severely ill and we lost her on March 2nd, with the first lockdown starting a couple of weeks later. Due to these circumstances, I had to put my studies on hold. Fast forward to a year later, and I'm still aching to get on to a course, so I decided to look again. This time, I find that the OU are doing the courses that I had been interested in, so on Monday, I phoned and spoke to someone there about the courses, fees, etc. He went on to ask me if I've ever had a registration made so they could find me easier. I said I'd had a fleeting look last year, but never gave any details or anything like that. And this guy confirms that I've not got an account registered and so he creates one for me. He takes all my details, and so on, so forth. Then, two days later, yesterday, I called back as I had a query and the guy asks for details to find my account. I give him my name, the email address I supplied, and the last three digits of my phone number. He stops me and says, oh, I have a number ending in number. I was shocked. The number he'd given me was an old number that I'd had last year, and since then, I'd finished that contract, had a temporary SIM card, and got a new phone with a brand new number for Christmas, which is the information that I gave the guy on Monday. The man proceeds to tell me, they have all my information on the system, all from when I was looking up a course last year, but sees absolutely no record of having an account to set up on Monday when I called. The course he said I looked up was extremely interesting and by far one of the most relevant to what I wanted, but I saw absolutely nothing like this when I searched last year, hence why I went and registered elsewhere, and I didn't even see said course when I did register this year. So. What the hell happened here? I need to clarify that I'm not just misremembering and did actually register last year, it just didn't happen. I even discussed with the friend of mine who's just graduated the same course I'm looking into about the lack of courses in this field at the OU, given its rep, before I found said courses this week. Was there a time shift or slip? Did the Matrix glitch? Did I somehow slip into another dimension or parallel universe? This happened at the end of June 2016. I was going through a low point and I wasn't taking care of myself, living like I didn't care if I died. A friend was trying to get me out more, doing things, anything to distract me from my problems. My friend took me to a horror convention. I didn't like horror and still don't, but I went anyways, secretly hoping to meet a single gothic curl or something. The week before, while watching the news, the Today Show, for clarity, they had an entire segment about the passing of Gene Wilder. I wasn't a fan or anything, I just thought his story was sad. I saw things that I didn't know about him. When we went to the convention, the only living actor from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was there signing autographs. 
They had a huge billboard with the morbid fact that this kind old man was the sole surviving actor. I thought it was disrespectful to Gene Wilder's recent passing, and all they did was talk about it. I didn't meet any single women there. <laughs> it wasn't a bad experience, but it wasn't exciting, either. A month after, I was watching the Today Show again before work, only to see that Gene Wilder had died again. I was like, what the hell? The Today Show is live, so they don't have reruns. I checked several other sources, and it was true that he had died again. Well, not again for the rest of the world. I instantly called my friend. I asked about the horror convention. Everything was the same, minus the whole soul survivor part. My friend insists that we never had a conversation about the morbid billboard or the disrespectful nature of it, nor had the topic of Gene Wilder come up at all. I know that we did. It was the main topic of conversation for the entire convention for us. I asked him, well, what did we talk about then? My friend insists that we talked about Willy Wonka and a few other horror movies, and how I thought that horror movies were a product of lazy writing meant for people who aren't smart enough to understand science fiction. I don't remember that at all, but I totally agree with myself. I just wouldn't have said it so rudely. I now, since then, quote that line that my other self said. I thought it was a Mandela effect, but I checked around and no one else remembers Wilder dying that time and coming back. I did have a few close calls driving right after that convention, and other than that, I don't actually remember dying for quantum immortality to occur, but I suspect it to be the case. The final weird thing is, as I said, I wasn't a fan, nor had I cared about Gene Wilder, and I didn't watch the Today Show remembering Gene Wilder's segment the second time around. So... I did a bio-search of him checking my memory of the segment that I supposedly never saw, and I knew his real name and history accurately. So, I proved to myself that it happened for me twice. This is pretty lame, but... It's been circling my brain all morning, and it's on theme for the sub, so here goes. My husband and I went to Home Depot for a couple of things. We went in through the garden department, as I needed a new pot for a plant. We picked out the pot, and were about to head inside, and I said, let's come back out and pay out here so I can get a bag of dirt, too. Since we didn't have a cart and the pot was kind of big. My husband says, I'm going to leave this out here and we'll just grab it when we come back out. So, he sets it down in an out-of-the-way spot near the door that goes from the garden section into the store. We picked up the rest of the stuff that we needed, and I decided to make a quick trip to the restroom before leaving. The husband says he'll go back to the garden, get the dirt, and pay. When I came out the door back into the garden, I saw the pot still sitting in the spot that we left it. My husband has ADHD, so this is not at all unexpected. I grabbed it and hustled towards the checkout where he is in line. About halfway there, I saw that he had grabbed a cart, and the pot was in the cart. I figured he came out a different door and grabbed the same pot from the display area rather than the one that we set aside, for whatever reason. So, I took the pot that I'd picked up from our stashed spot and ran it back over to the display to put it back. I didn't really think anything of it until later last night, when I mentioned it for some reason. He was like, what are you talking about? I picked the pot up from where we left it. I said, hmm, 
that's weird, because so did I. So we must have picked up two nested together and not noticed. He then said, No, I know for a fact that there was not another pot there because I didn't pick it up. I kind of kick-flipped it into the cart to see if I could, which is totally something he would do. So I couldn't have done that with nested pots without noticing. We confirmed with each other the spot that we'd left it, and the spot that we each picked it up from, and we were definitely on the same page. The only reasonable explanation we can think of is that someone else at Home Depot would have had to pick out the same pot from the display area, halfway across the garden department, and left it in the exact random spot in the three to four minute time span between my husband picking up ours and me coming out of the restroom. Granted, the odds of that happening are higher than the odds of a pot magically appearing, but the whole situation was really weird and random. When I moved out for college, my grandma bought me a small dining table and chair set. I ended up using this table as my desk primarily, as me and my now husband don't care to eat meals at a table very often. So let's call it my desk table. Four years of college ends, and we pack our stuff in one of those moving pods to store it for a couple of months until we get to where we're moving across the country. We pack the desk table. We get to the new place. I had to start grad school right away. We couldn't move into our apartment yet, so we stayed in a hotel for two weeks. This was a super stressful time. Big move, starting grad school, no money, didn't have access to all my stuff that I needed, preparing for my first try at the PhD qualifying exam, etc. Super uncomfortable hotel bed with no desk in the room. I wasn't sleeping well. I couldn't study effectively on the bed, and I had a pretty crappy time. We finally get to the new apartment, and I'm eager to get the desk table set up so I can start studying more effectively. Turns out, the desk table is freaking broken. It has metal legs that screw into a wooden top, and the metal is so bent into deformed positions that it won't screw back together. Nothing would save it, and I lost my mind. It was like the straw that broke the camel's back on my sanity that day. I wouldn't have the money for a new desk table, and I could not believe that this was happening. I try to calm down. I take some more stuff down to the dumpster, and I can't believe what I see next. There, near the dumpster with a free sign on it, is freaking desk table. The exact freaking same desk table. The same. Not similar. Not close. The absolute same as mine. Identical. I run literally run back to my apartment and tell my now husband. No time to explain, come to the dumpster to help me get something and hurry. He's confused and alarmed, but when we get there, I can see it on his face and he just says, What the hell? I say, I don't know and I don't care. Hurry, help me take it upstairs. We get this clone desk table, clean it, and I still use clone desk table to this day, ten years later. I still live at the same place, and there is rarely free stuff like this at the dumpster. I've seen like one couch, a dresser, and a couple of gross mattresses in ten years. I have no explanation for this to this day. Hey y'all, so I'm new to this sub and was inspired to share the glitchy things that occurred with a cat, not ours, at the first place that my now husband and I rented together. It was a beautiful spot, 
Honestly, we lucked out with this rental. The owners lived in the main house and had two small rentals in a pole barn on the property. Multiple acres out in the country. It had a pool, a lake, and a rock quarry. Owners used to crush up gravel in his own business, and we found all kinds of things in the quarry with permission to keep whatever. Quartz, amethyst, fossils, colored glass, etc. Anywho, they also had some outdoor cats. And I can't remember the name of the cat in question, so for the story, we're going to call her Kit. There were multiple incidents with Kit, but two stood out the most. Both times I was coming home from work. I worked as a florist at the time. To get to our place, I had to drive to the right of and park behind the pole barn, where our apartment's entrance was located. As I'm pulling in, I look to the left of the pole barn, still on the front side of the building, and I saw Kit. But there was also like six to eight copies of the same cat, all identical to Kit, and I'm not sure which one was the real one. They were sitting on these large decorative rocks just watching my car pull in. This was probably about 20 feet from my car. I wasn't driving super fast, and it took me a second to register what I was seeing. I didn't really process the information until I was pulling behind the barn. By the time I walked to the front of the building to check again, Kit was gone. The second time, Kit was pregnant. Working at the flower shop, if we had flowers that were no longer sellable, I could take home all the unsellables. I often did and had some leftover carnations on this day. As I was pulling into the driveway, I saw, to the left of the barn, the landlord's granddaughter playing with the small kitten. After I parked, I decided to walk over to the granddaughter and give her the carnations. She was excited about the flowers, but was really confused when I commented that Kit must have had her kittens. She just continued to look at me confused, so I went on to explain that I thought I saw her playing with one of the kittens when I pulled up toward the house. She said, no, Kit's still pregnant, and kept staring at me like I had three heads. So I quickly made my way back to my apartment, quite embarrassed and now confused myself. Kit had her babies a short time later. Other bizarre things definitely happened while we lived out there, but these moments stood out to me as being glitchy. So, this happened a few years ago. I was driving back from college. I live in the Finlands in the UK. And anyone who knows the Fenlands knows that roads are limited. I was driving towards Eli at the Sutton Roundabout. I lived in the countryside, and there was really only one way to get to my house from where I was coming from, and it was the way that I was going. It was rush hour, and I was stuck in slow-moving traffic. Bored, I was looking around at the other side of the road, and I spotted my dad's car driving in the opposite direction. His car was a bright blue Citroen Picasso. He got it when they first came out, and there weren't many of these cars in our area, so it did catch my eye. Not to mention his number plate ended with Ha Ha. I looked at the number plate first, and there it was. Number, 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 Ha Ha. Surprised? I looked up, and there were my parents. Both were looking really angry. I waved to get their attention, wondering what was wrong. They didn't look. They just carried on looking straight forward. I was a bit concerned with how angry they looked and the fact that they didn't notice I was sitting only a few cars in front of them. Not to mention, I was easy to spot. I had a bright orange Corza at the time, not easy to miss, and very rare color for any car. So, usually people who knew me noticed my car before I saw them. 
I couldn't really stop as the traffic was moving, and I couldn't turn around. As I said, the road was packed, and there were no safe places to pull over. For my direction, I was about 10 minutes from home, so I thought it was best to carry on home, and then ring Mum's phone as she wasn't driving to see what was wrong. I sort of raced home once I got off the main road, and on to the back lanes. We had quite a long winding drive with huge bushes on either side, so you couldn't really see our drive or the house from the angle of the road. As I drove up the drive, I was shocked to see my dad's car sitting in front and center of the drive, in its usual place. Confused, I parked up and ran in the house to find my dad and mom sitting in the living room. I asked them what was wrong, forgetting that there was no way that they got home first. They both looked perplexed and said nothing. I asked how they got home before me, and they said they hadn't left the house all day. Dad hadn't been well, so they were relaxing all day watching TV. I still wonder what I saw. It was their car. Same number plate. Mum was even wearing her distinctive raincoat. Even if they were pulling a prank on me, there is no way they would have gotten home before me. There is no road they could have slipped down to beat me to the house. Hello. I wasn't sure whether to post this here or in Mandela Effect, but as far as I know, this isn't something affecting more than my partner and myself. Last night... My partner and I were watching TV, and I decided to put a sweater on. I go into the bedroom, and I pull out a sweater that we had bought at Meijer back in early fall of last year. I'd worn it several times, but hadn't in probably over a month at this point. I put it on and throw the hood over my head while thinking, Huh, I don't remember this having a hood. When I walk back into the living room, she says something about how much she loves that sweater, and I sit down next to her. We get into a conversation, leaving the TV paused and talk for several minutes before I interrupt with, I don't think the sweater had a hood when we bought it. Now, we have a running joke for all of the many times one of us will remember something that's completely different than it is referencing the dubious theory of quantum immortality and fun. Whenever this happens to either of us, the other will reply with something along the lines of, uh-oh, how'd you die this time? Implying that our consciousness is in a new, slightly different universe because our clumsy asses died in the last one. So, I'm entirely ready for that kind of response to my observation. She laughs for a minute, but instead of asking me what killed me this time, she looks me up and down and says, Yeah, no, it, it definitely didn't. We pause and think for a minute. I ask her what she remembers the top of the sweater looking like, and she tells me, without hesitation, that she clearly remembers it having a North Face-style collar with the zipper going all the way up. I hadn't told her, but that was exactly what I remembered as well. Adding to the false memory is the fact that I know I've worn my coat over the sweater in the past, and that I have a particular way of flipping the hood out over the collar anytime I wear something with a hood under it. And I don't even remember having done that with the sweater. Usually, there's the rational thought in the back of my mind that I'm just not remembering something correctly. But this is the first time that both of us have remembered something being different in the exact same way. I had an existential crisis about it for several minutes before we could resume our show, and I still can't stop thinking about it. And 
this happened a long time ago. I didn't know about this sub, so I had nowhere to talk about it. I'm glad I get to tell this story now, as it's pretty mundane, but weird enough to me that I'll never forget it. My friend and I took a trip to a nearby city and stopped at a gas station to grab something to drink and use the restrooms. He went in first, and while he was in there, I picked out my drink. I noticed Pineapple Fanta. I hadn't tried it before, but it sounded interesting, so I decided to give it a shot. I know that I didn't just grab the wrong one by mistake either. I had to look closely to check the caffeine content of it, as I was trying to limit that at the time. When he got out, I handed him my drink and my debit card so he could get whatever he wanted and meet me in the car. It's important to mention that I'm fairly certain he would never do this as a prank or joke. We were really close at the time, but even outside of that, he wasn't ever known to do stuff like that. Messing with people never seemed to impress him much. It was also only the two of us anyways, so it's not like he could laugh about it with someone else. We drive somewhere else and start eating. I reach into the bag and grab our drinks, and somehow my pineapple Fanta is now orange Fanta. I said something along the line of, was there something wrong with the pineapple one? I know that's what I handed to you. He looked at the bottle and looked at me confused, and he said that he knew it was pineapple before too. He was actually going to ask me how it was, since it was kind of an unusual flavor. It really weirded us out for the rest of the day. I know I wouldn't have grabbed an orange one, even if I decided I wanted orange soda instead. I've always thought that orange Fanta was the worst orange soda, and definitely would have gotten Sunkissed or Fago instead. The only thing we've ever been able to come up with is that the cashier accidentally switched it out. But that makes us ask more questions than it answers. Why would she have one up at the counter? Why would it be nearby enough for her to accidentally grab the wrong one? She clearly wasn't drinking it. It was still sealed and cold. The whole thing reminds me of when variables and software mess up, and it reverts to something to a default value. Orange Fanta would certainly be the default Fanta if there was one. Maybe the simulation's code got mixed up in there somewhere. I'll start with saying that this is not the first odd thing that I've experienced, but it is the first time something has happened that could be construed as a glitch. So, the other day, during late afternoon, I needed to pick up something from the shop which is 500 meters away. I wanted to take my dog with me for a walk, so we took the bike track behind where my house is. The track is on a levee bank, and a highway runs parallel. So, it isn't a very spooky looking place. It's more just average. I take the same walk at least a few times a week. As my dog and I were around halfway through our walk, the thought that I may have recently experienced a glitch popped up in my mind. But I said to myself, Ha ah, well, it's just one of those things that's too hard to determine from lack of memory or paying attention, so who knows. Then, suddenly, just as that thought concluded, I feel a jerk and hear a sort of metal clicking sound. I look down at my dog thinking, oh no, thinking that the lead or leash clip had broken. It hadn't. I also saw his council registration tag lying on the ground. Now, the thing with these tags is, they're quite hard plastic, and are fastened around the dog's collar ring, the metal part that you attach the leash to. 
it's like a very short cable tie, and it wasn't broken at all. Thankful that the leash wasn't actually broken, I clipped it back onto the metal ring, picked up the tag to put it in my bag, and then went on my way, thinking, eh, time to write my glitch story to As the Raven Dreams. It felt pretty strange due to the timing. How I was just thinking about how I've suspected some glitches, but not enough to be proof in my mind, if you know what I mean. When we got back home, I thought that maybe, just maybe, the metal ring on the collar was stretched and that the tag maybe came off that way. But when I looked, I saw that the metal part was one seamless ring. No gaps. This is the only place the tag was, and even so, how does it account for the plastic tag, which is in a loop like a cable tie, coming off? It really doesn't seem to make any sense, and now I don't even see how I can put it back on. It feels like I was disappointed that I didn't have a glitch to tell, a story about, so the universe threw me a glitch. So here is my glitch to you, Raven. I hope that you and others enjoy. I entered an old house, very typical of the 50s in Brazil. The doors are kind of narrow gray, and the walls are all white. It looked like a normal house with furniture, an ironing board, and whatnot, until I arrived in a room with a window which faced the street. I remember the house being taller, and I saw other houses with people washing the sidewalk, sweeping the yard, that sort of thing. I remember seeing cars pass by, until suddenly people saw me, all at once, and I got scared. Then, I turned around and saw a young girl. I, I was scared, and she said that she was allowing me to stay there in that dimension. I couldn't identify faces, or how she and the other people I met were dressed. Then, I went to a room, in a bedroom, where they were watching television. Or it was a smart TV or something, I don't remember seeing a keyboard or anything. I remember that there was a program airing where they were listing celebrities who were successful in certain years. I remember seeing Elise Regina on the TV screen singing, and then I said, wow, but Elise Regina died in 1969. She died in the 1980s. A few more artists passed by that I had never heard of, including a German with a typical name and physical build, a white blonde wearing a tailcoat or a suit. So that's when I was able to take more control of this dream, and somehow I looked at the Steam website, and I looked for games from Val. To my surprise, I saw that Fallout and Metal Gear Solid were listed as Valve games. I clicked on Fallout and saw the preview photos in 3D, with a similar look and feel to GTA 3 in the alpha version. Everything was very smooth and it was a first-person game, completely different from what Fallout 1 was. I didn't click on Metal Gear, but both Fallout and Metal Gear had that icon similar to the style of the Half-Life or CS16 icon with the character on the right side with some lighter or darker background. Completely different of what they are today. Afterwards, I told them there were two boys and a girl, and they didn't answer me. Until then, I felt like they were going to disconnect me somehow from that parallel world. And then I woke up. For me, in that dream, I felt like hours had passed, but when I saw it, I'd only slept for about an hour and a half. I'd woken up at 10.30 a.m. today and set the alarm for 12.01 p.m. and woke up at, like, 11.52. But I'm still quite baffled as to what happened to me. I wrote about my friend on the train 
and I mentioned that he died six months later. Before he died, he was someone who used to write his name and address just randomly on things belonging to him, or in my journal or sketchbooks. I used to ask him why he did it, what mark he was trying to hold on to. He was an identical twin. His brother was slightly taller than he was. He would tell me all the time that he suspected that he was not going to live very long. He died at the age of 24. He was murdered by his older brother in a senseless argument where his brother stabbed him once in the chest. I was abroad at school at the time of the incident. He had called my parents for help moments before he died, and that also makes the whole thing even more tragic. Everything surrounding my friend those last few months had been extremely unusual. When I was home for summer vacation, before I went back to school, three months before his death, we walked about 15 to 20 miles together, talking about everything under the sun. His family and mine were amazed that we did it. When I went back to school, he would call me on the phone and say nothing at all and then we would hang up feeling as though we had a very long conversation. There was one point where, during one of these calls, he said how crazy it was that we were just listening to each other say nothing on the other end of the phone. We also wrote each other a lot. This was all pre-email days. I used to do ballet, so he and I would walk to my classes and talk, and then he would walk home. After he died, I got a card in the mail from him. He drew me sitting on the park bench that we would be happily chatting away on, but the image showed me sitting there with a portrait of him in a frame. His hunch was right, it seems. It was as though he always knew when he was going to die. So, my mom, my brother, and I moved into a new house in December. I spend most of my spare time in the kitchen as I love to eat, cook, and bake. And the photo attached might help you understand what my kitchen looks like and where the lights and light switches are. A couple of weeks ago, I went to turn the light on in the kitchen because I always walk down the hall and flick it as soon as I turn the corner, and it wasn't there anymore. I looked around on the wall and on the other side of the hall, and there was just a thermostat. I don't use the thermostat because I don't ever feel the need, so I wouldn't have mistaken it for that. Plus, I remember it being around the corner. I went to do it again tonight, out of habit, and I asked my mother if she remembers a light switch being there. And she said, That's really weird. I was thinking the exact same thing. Probably just something with our brains adjusting from the old place. She doesn't really believe in stuff like glitches in the Matrix, or parallel universes, so I just said, Yeah, probably. But... Inside, I knew it wasn't because of that. My heart was racing and I was shaking a lot. I felt so weird about it. It couldn't have been because of the old place either because we've been here for three months now and the old place was nothing like this. I find it so scary that she agrees but comforting that I'm not going crazy. The light switch for the kitchen is now a double switch with the dining room light over across the room by the sliding glass door. She doesn't remember that either. Edit. My best friend also remembers the light switch. We bake cupcakes together often. Also, I forgot to mention the light over the sink. It is its own separate switch, but... I never used it much because it's not enough to light up the whole kitchen. The 
this is literally the craziest freaking thing that has ever happened to me. I have no history of blackouts or mental illness that involve hallucinations or intense daydreaming, and I'm freaking the hell out. Like, 30 minutes ago, I thought, hmm, I should do the little things I've been putting off but want to do. So I did. I remember so distinctly hanging one of my pieces of art on the wall. I picked it up from leaning on the edge of my bed, and I put it on a thumbtack. Afterwards, I set out all of my nail stuff and painted my hand and toenails. When I was trying to fix my pillow cover, I accidentally got some black nail polish on my pillow. When I'm done, I relax with Amy Winehouse in the background, scrolling aimlessly on Instagram. Next thing I know, my sister barges in and tells me my chicken tikka masala arrived. I go to shoo her away and catch a glimpse of my hand. My nails are pristinely blank. Like, no residue at all. I stare at it for a second like, what the hell? It took so long to paint. Then I look at my toes, and they're also completely blank. The only thing I could think was, how in the world did that happen? My hands were playing on my phone the entire time, so... I start destroying my bed to find polish anywhere on my sheets, but nothing. At this point, I think I'm actually going mental as I'm putting my sheets back to where they were, and patting the pillows and such. I start karate chopping the middle of the decor pillows. I did it to the last one, and my damn nail polish is on the side of it. Same place and everything. I leap off my bed, and when I step off, I kick something over. My body took a screenshot. I look down, and my freaking painting that I hung up above my desk is now at the side of my bed. I'm freaking the hell out. I think I'm going crazy, and I'm looking up symptoms and causes of blacking out or hallucinating. <laughs> Can someone explain this to me? Is there something wrong? Well, I usually like to write a lot of fictional horror stories and that kind of stuff, but the story is the exception. I have experienced all of this. This is one of my first memories. I was about three or four years old. I was in my aunt's home. She lived on the third floor of an old apartment building in the downtown of my city. The rooftop was a place where all the tenants could hang out the laundry to sun-dry. You could access the rooftop by the main stairs of the building. The staircase entry in the rooftop was next to a little apartment that was originally built for the doorman, but it was always empty. There were always two doors. The one on the right takes you to the staircase, and the one on the left takes you to this little apartment. Well... That day, I went with my aunt to the rooftop to help her with the laundry. Everything was normal until I got out of the staircase and saw that we came from the wrong door. Now the staircase was in the left door. So I asked my aunt why and who moved the staircase to the other door. She was confused by my question, but didn't give me any importance. Other times that I went there with her, I asked the same, always referring to that day when I noticed that the staircase was in the wrong door. Now, speaking with my aunt about this, she tells me about that one random day that I went with her to the rooftop, and I mentioned the staircase position change. She was confused because I was so sure about what I was saying but she didn't give any importance to my words, because the stairs were always in the left, even if I remembered them always in the right until that day. I've never had any brain problems or accidents, and my aunt and cousin remember me talking about the staircase being moved, and that something was very strange. If I transported to a parallel universe, 
this one. At this point, I don't want to come back to my original one. I've made almost my whole life here, and I'm okay with it. 